Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for taking your seats and being prompt. Um, thank you all for joining us today, those of you who are here in the room and those of you who are viewing online. I'm Paul Butler. I'm the President and Chief Transformation Officer here at New America. Through our work here at New America, we hope to respond to global forces of demographic, technological, and social change. And we focus our work in five broad clusters of work. Um, democracy, education, technology, family well-being, and global security. Today's event is hosted by our Planetary Politics Initiative. Planetary Politics is the brainchild of a few folks. Um, our CEO, Anne-Marie Slaughter, members of our international security and our political reform teams. It was launched a year ago under the leadership of Candice Rondeau as a call to action for reimagining a world order that is inclusive and responsive to the challenges of our time. We saw the problem then as one that was simple enough to name but super hard to solve. Our international institutions were built for another era, and we need to find ways to revitalize them, to secure the rights of all people, and to protect the planet. Over the past year, planetary politics has focused its work in two domains, digital technology and climate change. And both of those will feature heavily in the conversations that we're going to have today. Our goal is to help stakeholders understand the new and evolving geopolitics of digitization and decarbonization. Alongside many university and nonprofit partners, we have produced critical research, most recently a report titled Governing the Digital Future. We've been convening workshops and task forces to bring global perspectives and novel thinking to these challenges. And like today, we have been convening global leaders and practitioners around these critical issues. We've gathered an amazing group of them here today. We're going to begin the afternoon with a fireside chat on the call for a new global governance. And before I introduce our distinguished guest, I'll first introduce our moderator. Bina Venkatraman is a former New America Fellow. She's a science and technology policy expert. She was senior advisor for climate change innovation in the Obama White House. She's a columnist for the Washington Post, focusing on the future, and is an author of the acclaimed book, The Optimist Telescope, Thinking Ahead in a Reckless Age. Thank you, Bina, for joining us. And on behalf of New America, it is our distinct privilege and honor to also recognize and welcome Nobel laureate and former Liberian president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. She has come all the way from her home country on the heels of an election to help us explore critical issues at the intersection of global governance equity and transformation. She was Africa's first democratically elected female head of state, serving as president of Liberia for two terms, from 2006 to 2018. Taking office shortly after the decade-long civil war, she steered Liberia through reconciliation and recovery, as well as the Ebola crisis. Her achievements in acting economic, social, and political change in, earned her international acclaim, including a Nobel Prize for Peace in 2011, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the United States' highest civilian award, the Grand Croix, the Légion d'Honneur, France's highest public distinction, President Sirleaf has also served in various regional and international leadership positions, 
including co-chair of the UN Secretary General high-level panel of eminent persons on the post-2015 development agenda. Chairperson of the Economic Community of West African States, and most recently, co-chair of the UN Secretary General's high-level advisory board on effective multilateralism. She is a tireless promoter of freedom, peace, justice, women's empowerment, and democratic rule. We are honored to host her here at New America. Thank you for joining us. Bina, over to you. Thanks so much, Paul. Welcome, Madam President. Thank you so much for being here for this conversation and for traveling all the way. Good to be here, Bina. Thank you, Paul, for, for this initiation to have this, this session today. And thanks to everyone for being here for an important conversation on a critical topic, which of course is planetary politics and global governance. So I think it won't be a, um, a sort of controversial thing to say in this room that uh, there are many global crises underway right now. There are slow burning crises um, like climate change, uh, which is becoming more and more urgent, and the problems uh, and challenges that arise from artificial intelligence, um, the war in Ukraine, the war now in the Middle East, uh, problems that imply that we need transboundary, global, multilateral solutions. Uh, but at the same time, it seems there's a growing skepticism and maybe even cynicism that we have the kind of international institutions, and you heard it in Paul's welcoming remarks, that could actually help us deal with these kinds of challenges. And I just want to start by asking, what's your take? What are our international institutions, are they up to this task? Well, you know, you, you mentioned the different crisis, global crisis that we face. Uh, but I think we need to first look at what's happened that led to those crises. Uh, the fact that there's been a crawl toward a fracturing of global governance structures, uh, effective multilateralism, global cooperation, have all been undermined um, over the past decade and on the fact that uh, we've not had this cooperation, uh, we find that uh, different countries are beginning to find different paths, staying away from the international order of peace and democracy, uh, pursuing in some cases uh, different political systems or being able to defend uh, their own differences. So those crises of having weakened uh, effective multi multilateralism and cooperation has led to the other crises so, that we now face. So do you diagnose the problem as uh, factors, or I guess fractures and, and problems within countries that are undermining already strong global governance structures? Uh, or are you diagnosing the problem as global structures that aren't adapting to the changes that are happening in society? It's a bit of both. Uh, in one case, uh, the fractures within, uh, within nations, within countries themselves, uh, the failure for inclusion to allow people to have a say, to participate in those decisions that will affect their lives, that's part of it. But also, um, global cooperation uh, because of the geopolitics, uh, uh, people being able to, to have their own spheres of influence, particularly as relates to countries in the global south. Uh, and this has led to some tensions uh, and, le and led to, as I say, uh, taking away from uh, a compliance with a general world order to which one realized that this was for the betterment of all society. And the fact that people uh, people who are affected uh, by all decisions, national or international, uh, don't have a say at a time when our nations, our entire global community is now full of young people, young people who are demanding leadership, women who have been left behind, who are also demanding that they have equity and equal opportunity. It's, uh, 
it's a world that, uh, that's changing and the, the crisis is severe um, and something needs to be done about it. So I, groups like these that will have a say in identifying some of the root causes of these problems and what can we do, but more importantly, leadership. Leadership in both uh, countries as well as in international organizations that can see the value uh, and the advantage of coming together as it used to be two decades ago. I want to get back to that question of how we include these different groups that you see as gaining more uh, voice and needing to have more voice in these institutions and in our global system. But before we get to that and talk about leadership, uh, right before we came on stage, you said to me, um, you might not like my answer if you asked me about how the UN General Assembly went. And being a journalist, that was like the juiciest thing that you could possibly say. So I have to ask you, how was last month's UN General Assembly? What's, what's your assessment of, of how that went? <laughs> I'm sorry, well, it's just well, it's my job. <laughs> well, that, that's, that's one thing. Uh, you know, I, I like to be truthful and I, and I take it that, uh, you know, uh, this is a kind of really confined group. Uh, no, I've, I've, because I've been in international public service for so long, I've um, participated in General Assembly uh, too many times, you know, as an official in the United Nations, and also 12 years as president. And so I thought this year I would be well off if I didn't listen to mostly the, the talks uh, that lead to no action. So I thought it was more important to do something. And there was, there was, I had a good alternative, more importantly. It was to sit in on a board meeting to, to talk about uh, a foundation that is focusing on Africa and African development. So. Was I kind enough in that response? That was kind. I, it's pretty diplomatic. I would expect nothing less. Um, you know, I think it's interesting because you know we lacked so sort of four of the five permanent Security Council members, heads of state. You know, Britain, France were missing. China, Russia, the heads of state were missing from from the UN General Assembly last month, and people were criticizing that as sort of an indication of the UN. Uh, losing its power and its ability to affect change. But you're saying something actually, which is I think something a general public kind of has as an impression of the UN, which is that there's a lot of talking happen happening even with the heads of state who do come and not enough action that's resulting from that. And I want to ask you, you've done some thinking about institutions other than the UN, uh, which are more sort of uh, multilateral institutions um, in the financial sector and that are working on global finance. And what's your diagnosis there? Um, is there more hope about getting those institutions to do the right thing? Um, let, let, let me say that I'm so glad that uh, the CEO of New America is Anne Marie Slaughter, and she was one of those, you know, working on. The, the UN Secretary General new global agenda, the common agenda, uh, leading to what was going to be a summit of the future. Uh, I see David Paracelli sitting there. Uh, he was the, uh, the main coordinator of what we did now. I think the, the real um, encompassing message is that the world needs to change. The entire global architecture requires reform. Institutions that were established at a time much, much, much before today uh, still use the same practices, essentially the policies, reflecting conditions of old. Times have changed, and all of the new threats faced by the global community need to be addressed through this reform. 
And this is why there was a group of very, uh, uh, a very uh, dispersed group, wide group representing all of the, the regions of the world that came together on the, on the, uh, the Secretary General's uh, mandate uh, to work on the aspects, the changes that need to be made. Now, do you want us to go through that or? Okay, let me just go through that and then you can come in. Well, I know one of those changes, and this relates to something you were saying earlier, just to give you a little uh, area of focus for that, is your high level, I think you're talking about co-chairing the uh, high level uh, board on effective I multilateralism board, yes. for the UN Secretary General. And one of the insights that came from that group uh, under your leadership was that we need institutions international institutions to be more inclusive. Mm -hmm. Can you say, how do we go about making that happen? It sounds like something that almost everyone would agree with, but how do you get from here to there? All right, well, let's take the global financial architecture. The two prominent international financial institutions, international financial institutions, that have really guided financial policies, uh, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Uh, they are owned and their leadership come from the major powers of the world as they were established after World War II. Um, clearly, we need some changes in that. Um, and that means bringing into their leadership more representation of countries of the world. They, they also, through their processes, con control the allocation of financial resources. Um, again, we think that changes would mean that some allocation some partnership arrangements should be made with financial institutions in the Global South, for example, development finance banks that have responsibility also for financial flows to support development. Um, we believe that some of the long-standing arrangements of conditionalities, what do countries have to do to be able to benefit from these financial flows uh, need to be rethought. Um, are we going to, the, the size of, of the financial envelope has not provided the scale required for transformation in poor countries. So they find themselves like in the, in the issue of debt, uh, being able to get debt relief, you know, through arrangements and for and COVID-19, send them all back into debt. Uh, and so th th that scale of resources, uh, being able to, to give to build capacities uh, for stronger domestic resource mobilization. Uh, and if I may say that one of the major reform that we need in the international financial architecture is the role of private sector, cap, private capital. Private capital that will be able to address the, constraint, the constraints that countries face uh, to improve their economies, to have value added to some of their primary uh, resources. Now, admittedly, there's an issue there because private sector, uh, you know, profit-seeking institutions, which is the right thing for what the way they are structured. And so that would mean if we're going to make sure that we we um, find a means for private sector to also be a part of the flows to developing countries, then they'd have to be means to, to uh, minimize the risks that they would face. So de-risking options would have to be determined 
to enable that to happen. Um, we need more representation on a discussion that I held in G20, you know, where the major uh, better performing countries, the world sit down to discuss financial policies, financial allocation of resources. Uh, there are uh, groups like finance ministers that are invited to some of those sessions, but they don't have real uh, decision-making powers. Uh, should we not have a chance to reform G20? And there have been talk about inviting uh, the African Union to have a seat in G20. Mm -hmm. The same applies to G7, where the seven major powers of the world are the ones that make the real policies that, re that relate to, to issues affecting development, affecting the world, particularly in the area of finance. How do, you, um, how do you think this would apply to a specific area, for example, with climate finance, which has been both a really critical part of global negotiations on addressing climate change, but also uh, a bit of a, an issue of disparity and an issue of conflict between countries in the developed and developing world. If you had a scenario where you had more inclusion of uh, countries that would be beneficiaries of climate finance, whether from governments, international uh, banks, and financial institutions, um, and also the private sector, uh, how could you see that playing out differently than sort of the scheme of climate finance we have now? Well, I, you know, I don't, I don't think we've yet um, seen a full determination on climate finance. I think we've seen many, you know, COP, COP, uh, how many COPs we've had. Uh, and we haven't yet seen the delivery of the um, resources that were committed. Even, even though there's some talks on a bilateral partnership arrangements, there are certain amounts that are being given to, to, to uh, deal with it. And I think maybe the, the latest meeting on that in Margaret is something you might see something different will, will come up. Uh, uh, and the, I think the, the countries of the, the global south have, uh, have been those that are affected most by climate change. And, 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 those, uh, and those that have, de have led to the problems of climate change are those in the North. Uh, so I guess if one were saying that we all now are part of a global amphitheater, then we have to see some of the resources held by the global North uh, be directed into the global South to be able to address the major effects of climate change uh, so that we have a, a more equitable world. And a more equitable world will, will lead to a, a better economically performing world uh, that would benefit all. Uh, I, I don't think those decisions have yet been made in a very comprehensive way and a very structured way that uh, one designs the allocation of resources based on certain criteria the criteria of not only those that need it most, uh, but those that are willing to do more for themselves, you know. Uh, and those discussions are ongoing in, in different fora. Uh, I am not sure we've found, found the, right, uh, uh, the right approaches or the right policies uh, that will deal in a way that will be fair to all. And how does that relate to your point about conditionality of finance to the developing world? So uh, your point is very well taken that the rich nations of the world uh, have contributed much more to the problem of climate change while the poor nations of the world have suffered the brunt of the impacts thus far, though we see disasters uh, related to climate change now <laughs> affecting the entire world. How? Um, Given that we know that that injustice and that asymmetry exists, but that we also know that we need all of the nations of the world to be developing in a clean way and reducing uh, emissions, if not bringing them to zero, uh, as soon as possible, uh, 
how does that relate to what kind of conditionality there should be on climate finance uh, going towards uh, poorer nations, nations that are less wealthy, nations that have contributed less to the climate crisis? I think most times conditionalities set forth by primary financial institutions or under partnership arrangements tend to be more one size fits all. Uh, not really recognizing the specificities of countries their endowment, their capacity, their, even their culture. Uh, and those conditionalities then, uh, some well intended, but if they don't fit the conditions and the time frame to be able to achieve the results anticipated, um, then they don't work and you find the countries again uh, slipping back. Uh, and I think we have so many examples of that. So if we're going to have reform, we need to again, we change institutions that would change policies and approaches and measures. One might see things like that addressed. Sometimes the conditionalities don't fit the problem at hand, uh, you know. Uh, that also leads to some of the tensions in the major powers arrangements. Uh, that those who may see human rights, you know, as a, you know, as a major uh, trigger uh, for development, quite rightly so for some. Um, for others, they might not uh, see that as being significant in achieving uh, the level of support that they would like to give to countries. So that may leave again uh, to differences and lead to some tensions in the partnership arrangements that uh, we're not subscribing to the same ideals. Uh, that says that uh, one needs to, to also recognize uh, differences. Uh, you hear People talk about Africa and what Africa needs, what Africa should do. Africa is 53 countries. <laughs> you know, with different endowment, different culture, different tradition. So if you're doing support for Africa, you may have to look at it with all these kinds of different specificities and see how you can tailor the response and his su support uh, to the real issue, to the you know the real situation that that pertains. This is uh, you're raising more complexity than our current institutions are capable of dealing with. So I am going to ask you um, at some point maybe to elaborate on on how we kind of get there. Uh, but I do want to ask you about democracy because when we think about problems like the climate crisis. And um, we look at the ways that democracies, including this one that we're in right now, um, are, have struggled to take, uh, to come together and take strident action uh, on climate change. I think there's some doubt uh, being sowed about how and whether democracies can respond by sufficiently marshaling investment in clean energy, sufficiently cutting emissions. Uh, you rebuilt a democracy, you built a democracy from the ground up, and um, I presume you're still a proponent of it as a system of government. And so I want to ask you, um, what gives you confidence? Does anything give you confidence that democracies are capable of addressing this problem? My first answer is yes, but let me expand on that a little bit. I believe it's clear from an African perspective that democracy has worked for us. It has enabled many countries to be able to achieve the level of development they have, even if insufficient. 
for the achievement of their overall national goals. The, the slippage today that has led to five coup d'etats in, in Africa, again has its roots into the global geopolitical environment, again the fracturing of leadership at the global level. Um, but democracy, I think, is it. In Africa, we still have one or two variations of democracy. We have place, places where they are managed succession, uh, anticipating who's going to take over. So you don't have, you still find that in places like Botswana, Namibia, some of the South African countries. But, but, but by and large, I think the people of Africa believe democracy is the way to go. We've had military rule. We still have authoritarianism. But democracy is what has enabled us to achieve what most countries have. I think that's one thing I must say. Whether we're dealing with conditionalities or we're dealing with the allocation, Again, in Africa, it is clear the primary responsibility for the development of Africa rests on Africa and African leaders. And African leaders must be the one to take responsibility. So in forging conditionalities, we should build into that package the fact that only leaders who do all the things we say we want to see done by others are done by themselves. We're going to open it up to questions in a few moments, and I hope uh, someone can give me a time check, if possible. And, um, but the question I want to ask you before we do that is, is about that. So you, you've talked about the responsibility of leaders in Africa and of African nations, including some of the smallest countries in the world. Um, what is the responsibility that these countries have when it comes to some of our big global challenges? What, it, what are the actions that, from your perspective, need to be taken by even small nations when it comes to these bigger planetary problems? I think, first of all, we need, we need leaders uh, who lead with strong commitment to the development of their country, with the uh, participation of the people in the different governance structures that exist at all levels. We need particular emphasis on certain things like education to create the capacity to govern effectively, health, to ensure the safety of people to be able to, to work. Um, we need integrity in, in governance uh, to ensure the allocation of domestic resources are used properly for the achievement of national goals. So I, I think those are, those are the things that uh, we do find a certain level of that in certain countries. And we, don't, we also need a regular uh, peaceful transfer of power so that we don't have, you know, too long. We need, we need change, and we need change in people too. So. Those are all some of the basics that, those are discussions that are ongoing now. And that's what might lead to change in the global, but we have to change first, right? Thank you. I want to invite people to come up and ask questions of the president. Hi, Richard Ponzio from the Stimson Center here in Washington. Uh, congratulations on the new high-level advisory board report. 
Uh, as a think tanker, I think many from the policy advocacy community would be keen to hear two of your favorite proposals from uh, the, with the COP28 around the corner and climate broader environmental governance. What is something that we should be thinking about maybe championing in the run-up to the summit of the future next year? And then similarly, you started talking about it today, the section on development financing and the momentum we're seeing around the Bridgetown Initiative on changes in the global financial architecture. But one final related point, why should our government here in Washington, the United States, uh, get excited and focused on this agenda, especially with a big uh, presidential election coming up next year? Okay, three questions in one. One, one. one at a time would be ideal. Just, I'll throw that out there just on behalf of the interlocutor here. Uh, the, well, let, let, let's, let's take it one by one. I think on the, on the, the entire uh, financial agenda, um, we believe that much of what's in the Bridgetown Initiative is one that talks about the blending, um, the scaling, the blending, the private sector, uh, the insurance of, of proper allocation. Uh, it also reflects the same things about uh, decision-making in financial institution participation uh, of some of the the other institutions from the South. So uh, the, all of the, the rest of the measures to improve the uh, financial, global financial architecture, I think are, are well stated. It goes beyond the, uh, the, the Bridgetown Initiative, but the Bridgetown Initiative is the core of all of that. And then what was the other one? So the first was what were your sort of one or two sort of favorite or priority recommendations from the High Level uh, Advisory Board on Effective Multilateralism looking towards next year's summit on the future? Is that right? Well, the number one priority has to do with the global financial architecture. The change of that, change in, in the structure of the World Bank and the IMF, uh, bringing participation of the uh, multilateral development bank, uh, being able to have the allocation of resources uh, made in such a manner that they address the major causes, the, the, being able to, to make countries enable through their endowment uh, to get the domestic resources to develop their own countries. So that for me is number one. Number two, the whole global security architecture, we haven't talked about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that means that work, changes have to be taken at the Security Council. Uh, today we have a, a moribund Security Council. Uh, and, and it's been going that way, it's been that way for the past several years because of the fracturing of uh, global political something, so. And I think that I think sort of that, relates that, to the final. Know, that, that sets the basis for why we're seeing democracy slipping. And you have uh, coup d'etats and, and you have these wars today. I mean, and, it's, and with the existing situation in Ukraine, now in Palestine and, and, and Israel, it's going to, to bring more pressure more pressure on finding the right solution to these. At the same time, granting groups like terrorism, granting groups that would like to see military regime train, that feel that they can get away with it because there's not a body. So again, how do we bring better representation or something? If I may also talk about the on pandemics and health. I can say that we had a group, I was co-chair of a group with, uh, with Helen Clark, former Prime Minister of New Zealand, that worked on a whole measure of, of trying to uh, make WHO a stronger and, and better finance institution, international health regulation being set up for reform. 
And we've been on advocacy for the past year or so talking about International uh, Health Threat Council. And we haven't succeeded in getting any focus on that. So here we are going to go into another global agenda. Uh, People and Planet, the name of the report, Effective Multilateralism. And we're going to be talking about that. How many global agendas will we have until we see the political will to make them happen, to make some of them happen? Uh, I think that's a challenge to everybody. Um, hi, my name's this thing sucks. Uh, Steve, I uh, work and study here in the city. Thank you very much for today's forum. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, Madam President, uh, for a number of us who were young producers, uh, one of the last times that you came through the city, uh, we really appreciated your, uh, your comments and your interaction with members of the Hill, uh, Chris Coons, uh, Ron Klain. Could you, amid today's sort of fractured political environment, and that's probably being charitable, uh, could you give us a, an overview of uh, your last interactions with members of Congress uh, during the uh, Ebola crisis? And, uh, and my other question is, uh, is there a great game uh, for Africa? Uh, Wagner Group comes to mind, some private military outfits, uh, resource extraction, that sort of thing, and, and, and uh, the PRC's efforts in China also. So thank you very much. OK, so just so we, uh, the second question, can you just sum it up in a sentence? I'm Is not there sure. a great game, a, ren a, great a renewed game? great game, uh, game, G-A-M-E. Oh, great game. For Africa. Great game. I'm not sure I understand the question either. <laughs> so, okay. I think the question is, is, is Africa up for grabs yet again? With, with, with then, between China and, between China and, and Russia, 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 yes, and okay. School, yeah. Right, is there a game for Africa, oh, not? You know, I've, I've heard talk about, oh, recolonization and all this thing. That's, that's, that's not true. Uh, there is, I mean, Africa's past the stage of, of being a place you can just come and pick, pick what you want and, you know, and run with it. Now we've gone past that far. Yes, long-standing historical and traditional relationships do exist, uh, maybe to our own disadvantage, uh, that we haven't built a stronger, effective uh, union among ourselves. And, have a common agenda, what we call the Africa's, Africa 2063, the Africa we want. Uh, we've put it forward, but it's so aspirational that we haven't moved it from aspirations uh, to activism. Um, and so in that respect, but uh, there, will, there will be no recolonization of Africa. In terms of either soft power influence of China or resource, even just resource ownership or of uh, foreign companies, do you have any concerns about that? Yes, yes the, like I said, there's geopolitical intervention. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's driven by greed. Mm -hmm. Greed for resources. Sometimes it's driven internally by, again, my power and, you know, self self gain and, and whatnot, corruption and all the, and all of that. So that that's sometimes part of it and that exists in within countries and exists in partnership between countries. Uh, but I mean we have to take responsibility on on why why uh, we have not grown up in such a way that uh, we don't need um, we don't need uh, French military support. Uh, let's let's support the development of our own armies. You know that's where we need the support. I mean, but not so much armies. Let's build the economies first, so we don't have to have too much money spent on armies. Uh, and did you, did you want to share anything about um, your experiences talking with members of the U.S. Congress about the Ebola crisis or since then? Well, let me say that I'm, I'm proud to have had a very strong bipartisan relationship. <laughs> we want to hear the juicy stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, we want to hear it all. <laughs> No, 
I'm, I'm very serious about that. <laughs> Uh, that uh, we've had, have had that, and it has enabled me to have the kind of cooperation that we were able to get for Liberia through legislative support because of that. Uh, and so, and and I think all all our countries should should work in that manner. When it comes to 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 China, because there's always the question about you know China. Uh, China has a different approach to development. China's, China has the, the big step approach, you know, build big, big uh, football arenas, football stadiums, big, big. Yeah, they do, they do really benefit everybody. Um, they believe in big infrastructure, the build the raid rules and the schools and all. Um, but those have a place also in development. It's needed. Uh, this is why you see countries still want it. On the other hand, we do know that when it comes to the social services like health, education, I mean, those are the bedrock anyway of improvement in any society. And so, but those things are not quick fixes. Uh, China has quick fixes. Five years, you may get a big railway. You need 20 years to get quality education. Uh, and so how can we blend the approaches and the assets of both instead of seeing it as, as a, 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 well, we get into a situation where they're so opposite as a, a fight for that, and I, I don't, I know. Just imagine, just imagine if we could get the major powers of the world to agree that they'll have a cooperative endeavor when it comes to development in the South, and that the resources could be pooled from each into a common pool with the right conditionalities and the allocation that's fair and just to the need and the, and the uh, abilities of the country's own effort. Just think if we had that, how much we could develop, we could develop the infrastructure in Africa that would enable something, I, you know. The 800 million people in Africa don't have electricity. How we, how we, how we going to, how we going to respond to that? It's very difficult. So this is why we really need to get, we need to get back. We need to get them back, back this cooperation to find a way to get it back. We need political will on the part of everybody. Political will, that's, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, um, Jill Shooker, I'm a counselor for UNESCO here in the US, and I'm gonna try a trifecta, which hopefully will be quick. First, on, the technology piece on AI. I'm curious if you have thoughts as to whether you think uh, the question of international leadership and institutions, if that can be led by the UN successfully, or should there be a different kind of institution that can reach the, digitaliza the digitalization that's needed in Africa. Your comments on democracy and global security. Um, the issue of coups that are taking place seemingly frequently right now in Africa. I'm just wondering what your perspective is on why that seems to be happening with more frequency uh, almost back to the 60s. Um, and with that, uh, the third question is, you were saying you uh, Africans need to be able to, I believe you said, to focus more on themselves in terms of security. And I'm wondering what you think about the force that's going to Haiti and uh, whether you think that's appropriate. Thank you so much. You've got to help me with those questions. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'll do my best. Yes, so the first was about AI and whether the UN is an appropriate international institution to deal with the challenges of AI globally or if we need a different kind of global institution. I really don't know 
Well, I know that I don't know much about AI, artificial intelligence. I don't. And I wonder if, if um, we all in the world know enough about it, except those that are who are technically strong in, uh, in AI. As a matter of fact, I, 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 I see some fear in the growth of AI as I, as I see it take away from the human endeavor. Hmm? So, but will we need a specialized invitation to respond to it? Maybe so. But I do hope we will see the institutions we have now uh, re-energize themselves and reinvent themselves and come back to the area where they are cooperating to be access the existential threats that we face now that many of the less developed countries have no capacity uh, to understand or to be able to, uh, to manage it. This sort of relates to your earlier point about inclusion, and then I think we'll take a final question because we're leading uh, to the end here. Um, but you talked about more people being able to express their voices in these international institutions. And I think part of the challenge right now, and part of the reason there's a lot of skepticism about institutions responding to problems like artificial intelligence, like the United Nations responding to artificial intelligence, is that people see some of the harms and they see some of these problems very up close and personal in their lives and they see something like the UN is very far away from their lives. Is there something in your recommendations that would help bridge the gap between people and these larger international institutions? I think inclusion, inclusion of people. Mm -hmm. At the national level, one need to move away from the centralized power and authority into building on the periphery, you know, at the mayor level, at community levels, and all where really, those are really the, uh, the front, the front uh, uh, responders. In the health, that's what we find of community health workers. COVID-19, it was community workers. Uh, they're not given sufficient support, sufficient compensation, sufficient recognition. Uh, being able to build the, the places where people can have town hall discussion, not just when there's campaign. Then town campaign, you get a lot of town hall discussion. Uh, but as a regular means of understanding, UN decisions, African Union and other regional institutions decisions, being able to have places where people understand them and know them, so that when you ask about a UN institution, most persons in, in, in the in community, particularly in rural areas, will not even know about it, you know, because there's not enough opportunity to involve them, to know what it is, for them to, even if they, they cannot make the decisions because they don't have the capacity and the understanding to make the decision. But with their knowledge, they can have more ownership, and more ownership will bring more self-endeavor. You know, because talk about the coup d'etat, as was, was mentioned. The coup d'etat became because uh, it started through um, terrorism was not responded to. Insecurity arrangements, it is not the security decision, the security council that can really Prevent, prevent something from happening. You've got to have security bodies that are equipped, that are empowered at the regional level to be able to, uh, to deal with that. Uh, representation at the global level, yes, is good because more voices with diversity in, 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 um, in diversity in knowledge, diversity in action is good. Uh, being able to shift from, you know, peacekeeping forces to forces of pre conflict prevention so that you don't have to spend so much money responding to crisis if you can use less money preventing crisis. Uh, so it's trying to reframe, reframe the whole uh, global agenda I think that we need to spend more time on. Just a small task, and I'm going to give the final question to you here, and uh, please tell us your name. 
Hi there. So I'm Ben Dalton. I, I work here at New America. Uh, we have some online questions that are coming in, so I'll just keep this very brief. Um, so one question is, are most of the reforms and changes that are being discussed here, uh, do they rely on good governance and competent leaders? And if that's not the case, are you not essentially throwing good money after bad? Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> sounds, sounds, yeah. sounds it's like true, it's true, saying. no, it's true, I, there's no denying that, it's true. We've reached the end of our, but I do want to ask, I want to just abuse the moderator role for a second and ask you to tell us, I think you've given us a lot of areas of concern in terms of the state of the world order, and I think many of us wake up, if not uh, struggle to fall asleep because of our concerns about current global affairs. Uh, what's the single th most hopeful thing that you see happening in terms of world-changing uh, responses to these challenges? Five letters. W-O-M-E-N. <laughs> no, no, seriously, I do believe women and youths have been the marginalized groups in society, simply because that's the way it's always been, that things are dominated by men, you know, misogyny, uh, so I think you see a movement toward more opportunities, more equity for women, uh, more, uh, more educated, more knowledge, more, more demands and things for women and for youth. And I think unless we turn that around so that we find these two groups are allowed much more of a say in decision making at both national and international level, level and I ask you to just look at the, you know, look at the, um, the results and the reports that we get and see where, where uh, when women lead, uh, women have a little bit of a different uh, approach, uh, preservation of human life, uh, empathy for others, uh, trying to find means for bridging differences, you know, I think. But that's not to say that one wants to say women will rule the world. I wish it would happen, but it won't. Uh, but I think if we have more women participation in every aspects of national and global decisions, and they have a say in leadership, not just as tokenism, you know, but in leadership, that uh, I think you'll find a, a more peaceful and a more balanced world. Thank you. You've certainly blazed a trail there, uh, not just for Africa, but for the world. And thank you so much for being here for this conversation and traveling all the way from Liberia to uh, share your insights with us today. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you. In just two decades, digital technologies have come to touch every aspect of society, reshaping media, commerce, security, and even social life. The benefits have been profound, but so are the harms. Rampant disinformation, privacy violations, cyber attacks, and the worsening of inequalities. We have yet to develop global frameworks to govern digital technology. It's clear greater stewardship of cyberspace is needed to ensure the digital revolution promotes human security, equity, and prosperity. But what should global tech governance look like? Who should write the rules? And how? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gordon LaForge. I am a senior policy analyst with the Planetary Politics Initiative here at New America. Uh, as that video just suggested, our next discussion is going to focus on global digital governance. Uh, this is a subject that we think in, uh, about a lot here at New America in planetary politics, and we've been working on a lot. 
Um, as Paul mentioned in his opening remarks, we've just published a report entitled uh, Governing the Digital Future. It's on our website. I encourage you all to check it out. This panel is titled A Just and Equitable Digital Future. And to introduce our panelists and steer us through this conversation, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Candace Rondo. Candace is the senior director of both Planetary Politics and the Future Frontlines program here at New America. She's also a professor of practice with the Center on the Future of War at Arizona State University. And she is a leading expert on the Wagner Group. Candace is an award-winning, for which she's been getting a lot of attention recently. <laughs> you may have seen her on TV. Uh, Candace is an award-winning investigative journalist. And previously, before coming to New America, she held positions at the International Crisis Group, the US Institute for Peace, and she was Washington Post bureau chief in Kabul, Afghanistan for a stint. She is and always has been a very sharp observer of how digital technologies shape conflict, sovereignty, and human rights. So with that, I will turn it over to Candace. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gordon, for uh, that very warm and kind of scary introduction. Um, at at first, uh, let me also just say, Madam President, th thank you again. You've really honored us uh, by being here. I hope you get a selfie before we leave. <laughs> That's the most important part of my day. <laughs> my mother will kill me if it doesn't happen. <laughs> You don't want that on your head. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just so pleased to be here. Uh, it's, it's been a long journey for our team, for Gordon, uh, for Patricia Groover, the co-author of the report uh, that we released uh, very recently, uh, Hila Rasul Ayub, our, our director, uh, who works on Power Reimagined, uh, looks at uh, climate change, uh, all of our panelists here today, um, um, the entire team uh, has worked so hard uh, to get to this moment. Uh, and in fact, uh, the conversation about you know, global disruption is something that we've been having uh, for a long time, uh, but really started for, for me, for Anne-Marie, uh, during the pandemic, uh, when we were stuck uh, at home uh, with not much to do other than panic. <laughs> uh, and, and this is the idea that we came up with, is that we need to have this conversation, that they have to be, the conversations that we're having about uh, global security today have to be much more inclusive. Uh, we have to ask very hard questions um, and challenge um, the kind of status quo, as Madam President uh, just did. <coughs> um, you know, the last decade uh, and in the last few days, let's just, let's just talk about the last few days, we have seen um, a, a major war, the beginnings of a major war unfold on our cell phones, on tablets, on laptops. Um, and it's the second time around in the last 18 months that we've seen massive conflict unfold uh, on digital devices. Uh, 12 years ago, we were talking about Web 2.0. And uh, we were worried about our kids uh, and family members getting sucked into Facebook. Now, uh, we're worried about the singularity and what will happen with artificial intelligence. How, how will it reshape uh, human communities and human society? Uh, and these are the questions that we've been grappling with uh, over the last little while through our Digital Futures Task Force um, and uh, a gathering of individuals, uh, which includes, of course, Alejandro and, and several others, um, who've been really asking hard questions about the way digital technology is changing our idea of sovereignty uh, in a world where we used to think about it as you know, territory and boundaries and lines on maps. You can't do that in the virtual world. Um, and it's scrambling the way we think about norms and rights uh, and power, most importantly. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, Alejandro Pisante is not only one of my favorites. Don't get jealous, guys. Um, <laughs> he's also one of the shining lights of our Digital Futures Task Force. Um, he is the Director General for Academic Computing Services of the National University of Mexico uh, in Mexico City. He served uh, the, uh, the community as a member of the ICANN board um, of directors. Uh, th those are the people that name domains um, and keep registry information. Um, he's educated in Mexico. And Alejandro does not play, let me tell you. Um, he knows a lot about science. He has degrees in chemistry, um, uh, physical chemistry. He spent time as a research scholar at uh, the prestigious Max Planck Institute for Research on, uh, on the solid state in Stuttgart, Germany. 
It's one of my favorite countries, and uh, Stuttgart's one of my favorite cities. Um, his career has been bound up with computing since 1972. We won't ask your age. Uh, and with networks and, and the internet since the late 1980s. Uh, in other words, Alejandro knows what he is talking about. Um, the other person on this panel who knows what she's talking about is Nanjira Sambuli. Um, she is another kick butt digital warrior, and her accomplishments are so outsized, I'm not really sure I really should be sitting on this stage. Um, Nanjira is a Ford Global Fellow. She is also a board member of the New Humanitarian um, Development Gateway and Digital Impact Alliance. She also advises Carnegie Council's AI and Equality Initiative and the Alliance for Inclusive Algorithms. She's a member of the Gender Advisory Board at the UN Commission on Science and Technology for uh, Development. Uh, and as if that weren't enough, um, she also <laughs> um, really leads all the advocacy efforts on digital uh, equality uh, at the World Wide Web Foundation. Well, you used to, yeah. Well, you used to. <laughs> um, and she's worked at iHub, uh, Nairobi, uh, where she provided strategic guidance for growth on technology and innovation research in the East Africa region. Thank you for coming. My God, what a biography. OK. Um, <laughs> our third panelist, uh, Rohinton Medora, is no less distinguished. And he soon will be my favorite. Um, <laughs> Rohinton is a distinguished fellow and former president of the Center for International Governance and Innovation, uh, CG. If you guys don't know it, you should. Um, everyone apparently loves having Rohinton on the board because he is the chair of a lot of boards. Uh, he's a chair of the board on the Institute for New Economic Thinking, vice chair at the McLuhan Foundation, board member of uh, the Partnership for Economic Policy, and he is on the advisory boards of the WTO, cha WTO chairs uh, program, uh, UN Merit, uh, and Global Health Center. He is also a professor of practice uh, at McGill University's Institute for Study and in International Development. Rohinton also sits on a commission on uh, global economic transformation. He knows the most famous guy in the world on soft power, Joseph uh, Stieglitz, and many, many, many other things. Um, welcome, all three of you. Thank you for joining us. So um, we were t you know, touching on this sort of challenge that we have now with the way digital technologies, and particularly AI, are really transforming um, everything from conflict to sort of crisis management. Uh, and there are some good things, too. Let's talk about, you know, MNRA. I mean, without, without artificial intelligence, we would not have had uh, a pandemic, um, I think, relief, uh, ultimately. But there's been a lot of inaction on regulating uh, digital technologies, which have let platform companies like Meta, um, you know, and others do a lot of damage um, in communities uh, that are particularly vulnerable. We can think of the crisis with the Rohingya genocide. We can think of uh, many different instances. Given that history and background, um, I'm going to turn to you, Alejandro, first, um, because you are my favorite. Um, <laughs> uh, no. um, really, where are we going to go next? I mean, we've got inaction, a history of inaction, but any chance of that shifting for AI? Do we see any kind of activism happening? Take a deep breath. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, no, first, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to oblige to thank Candace Sundro, uh, Gordon Laforge, Patricia Gruber, Riley Rogers for uh, all for the, this invitation. I take it uh, especially uh, as, as, as a big honor because you already know me. So that's uh, you already saw me in action in this same room for the for the task force, and that was a fantastic experience, which I thank you for. Uh, for. Uh, I'm also in awe of the convening power of, uh, of, of this organization for many years. I visited over here more than a decade ago. Uh, and I'm very glad to, to tell you there's someone in this room who really knows this stuff. That's uh, Dr. Steve Crocker, who's sitting down there. He's former chair of ICANN. He's, among many other merits, the person who invented the request for, for, uh, for comments procedure for standardizing the internet in the Internet Engineering Task Force, and uh, many, many other towering achievements, and still very, very active in these fields. And there's David Olive, from, who's the ICANN office, and Iria Puyosa, who comes from a DFR project. Uh, who, I mean, this is, uh, for me, a, uh, an additional sign of convening power, and I'm very honored to be sitting on the same uh, days that uh, Madame 
Johnson Sirleaf was. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of your work in Liberia since it was happening, and I mean f from the news, and uh, in absolute awe of, uh, of of those achievements and what you are now charged with, that may shape the digital world as well in in, in many ways. So, I, I, now that I have that out of my chest, of my chest. Uh, so there is action and inaction. But there, it's not only inaction. Uh, what we have to realize, I think, I'll go straight to this. Uh, today's panic will be tomorrow's platform. Um, a few centuries ago, Plato was scared and very disgusted that people were resorting to writing and he thought that would damage the use of memory forever. And we have had the same type of concern when uh, radio was going to intrude into our kitchens with voices from outside the house, whether it was going to be you know, good music and uh, constructive education or propaganda, no one knew at the time. And of course, both things happened. And it's all the way, you know, every new media. The thing is that maybe these disruptions were change, happening once every millennium, then once every half millennium, and now we have 20 of them a year. Uh, so we are always chasing the past. We're fighting the last war, so to speak. What I th think that's happening more importantly now is that we, are, we have to realize that the platforms, the panics, the changes, uh, Web 2.0, uh, artificial intelligence, what have you, are shedding light on what humans actually do to each other, mm. individually or through institutions or through organizations, organizations that may be, you know, virtues like the Wikipedia or evil like uh, terrorist groups or criminal gangs, the whole criminal ecosystem. The cyber criminal ecosystem is an exact map of the classic physical uh, ecosystem. It goes by segmentation, need to know basis, cells, hiding information, hiding identity. It's very amplified by the internet, as we have talked sometime. I see six factors to map these things from what we know on offline to what happens online. Uh, the first of them is, of course, the hyperscale of the internet, the speed with which things can happen. You know, the flare-ups can happen in a few hours. That would take a couple of years, 50 years ago. We have the question of identity, which the internet doesn't really give you any identity except your IP address, which is very fickle. And people can hide behind the internet for crime, or they can hide behind the internet for whistleblowing and for starting a rebellion against an oppressive regime. So these are two-sided two, two uh, knives. Then we have the, cross, the global reach of the internet, which means we are always crossing jurisdictional borders, which may, can maybe for the good to spread uh, sexual health education to young women in religious oppressive regimes, and there are many religions that are like that, at least locally, uh, or to organize crime. And we have a lowering of barriers to start things, to start organizations, companies, um, NGOs, or criminal gangs. We have a friction reduction, which means things happen very fast with a click of a button, and sometimes we have to manage against that speed so that you won't transfer your whole heritage to someone who tells you that he is uh, the, 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 the heir of uh, General Taylor from Liberia who holds you know, tons of gold. And uh, <laughs> you, for, for a modicum of $50,000, he'll transfer everything to you. Uh, and that, what, that was the, the, the first news people have about J Taylor uh, outside uh, the people who read the news. It's amazing. And the final one is a huge trove of memory. So now what we have for AI is we have to look at it in this same way. What is it doing? Uh, who is doing what? And then see how it's changed by the technology. Dissect and then reassemble. But then you know what remedies will have to be for people. Laws will not work about technology. Laws. The object of the law is behavior. It's people or collectivities or governments, but the law will not fix steel. It will fix using twisted steel to open locks outside your house. Mm. The behavior. Yeah. It's all, I mean, you know, policy that focuses on behavior is rare mm. <laughs> lately. Right. Um, but Nanjir, I know you have something to say about this, but let me yeah. add an additional kind of 
nuance uh, okay. to the question, which is, you know, we have seen a lot of big names in artificial intelligence come out, some people you know, um, but the conversation is pretty limited right now in terms of like who's at the table. What What's your take on that? Yeah, I agree. It's not that there's been inaction so much as the kinds of action we need from power holders are insufficient in the sense that with technologies, especially in the last two decades, the harms, whether it's from the era of Facebook and other social media, sort of the rate of diffusion of technology has become faster. The warning signs have almost always come from the developing world. So the adverse uses we started to see um, from Myanmar right off the bat in 2013 when you know, these platforms started to sort of proliferate across societies, those were ignored. Um, my favorite an example here is usually Cambridge Analytica and how it's spoken about here in the US, but before they, cut their, they got here, they cut their teeth in operations in Kenya, in Nigeria, in South Africa and elsewhere. As those warnings were being sent out, they weren't being heard. So there's also a lot about where are <coughs> you know, sites that are centered for crisis for these issues to be taken seriously. And it's the same thing we're seeing with artificial intelligence now. The language around safety, the language around the moratorium and other calls for action center very specific viewpoints and not everybody's. So for one, there's an interesting sense of creating fear um, and this fear is also obfuscating the need for governance and in this sense the need for state actors to set the rules of the road that these powerful players can then heed to. So they want to create the panic and then tell us, tell us that they're the ones who know how best to govern themselves. Y'all just don't worry, we've pa we've, you just stay panicked, we're going to figure this thing out on the back end here and we'll come back to you with more technology. Uh, rather than fixing the impulses that are driving, whether it's AI being deployed prematurely uh, without the right requis you know, measures and continuing adverse practices like relying on underpaid labor to train the models that then we're all experimenting with. So it really, is, in a sense, is technologies have shown us, uh, to, to, to build on Alejandro's point, it's a, they've been a mirror and we're not liking what we're seeing in the mirror and we're running off panicking rather than looking deeply and staring deeply into what is being reflected for us to fix. So that remains a challenge, um, whether we're talking about those days of Facebook or now artificial general intelligence as uh, our friends in San Francisco want us to frame the conversation. Our friends in San Francisco, so powerful, Rohinton. Um, what's your take? So first, thank you for having me um, as your least favorite panel. <laughs> And, and, and I'd make, I guess, two points on, on sort of AI concentration and action and inaction. The first is that um, I, I like to think of AI as having uh, broadly three streams of impact. Uh, one is on the sort of nexus of issues around security, human rights, privacy, surveillance. The second is on uh, economy and jobs and, and what it does to labor markets. And then the third is the most of science fiction like singularity. What, what happens when AI outwits us all? And if you think of action and inaction, I'd say there's been some um, not enough, and I'll come to that in a second, action on that first sense. I mean, we all understand the, the security and so on dimensions, as you all pointed out. Um, but values are different. On the second stream, uh, jobs and so on, I think there's been almost no action. I mean, we talk about taxing robots so that governments can produce or fund public goods for the citizens, but we're not there. Um, and we're, there's nothing that I have seen that suggests that we're going to deal with that anytime soon. And then on singularity, I mean, there's no, I mean, we have evidence from biotech and, and other kinds of advanced sciences that there are ways for societies to grapple with nuclear technology. But we haven't really come anywhere near that. There's a debate about whether you can cut off computing power, but it's still at that stage. My second point, where there has been action, think of the range that we're seeing. Uh, the draft EU legislation on AI is risk-based. My, my country is Canada's, is too. Uh, China's is kind of based on technologies. And what these countries do is 
they talk about low risk and high risk AI. And in the EU legislation, for example, high risk AI is something like social scoring or the use of facial recognition technology in public places is banned. It's just not good. In China, that is exactly what AI is used for in the public good. I mean, there's a genuine sense there that some of this, like going through airports or dealing with COVID, this technology has worked. And we are going to use facial recognition technology in public. How do you square those? Mm. So I guess I'm saying there has been action at the national and sometimes regional level, globally, and I, I know you'll come to that, making these different perspectives talk to each other in a way that we have a global chapeau, which I thought your report did quite well, given how impossible the situation is. Mm -hmm. We're some ways from it. Yeah. So let me, I, I, I'm really a big fan of going off script, um, and my team knows this very well. Uh, but I want to unpack something that you just mentioned, Rohintin. It's something that we've been kind of debating and talking about a little bit, is the, the impacts of artificial intelligence on the workforce. Um, two things happened over the summer, right? We saw um, the uh, Screen Actors Guild and the Writers Guild go on strike um, because really, A, the technology of streaming, right, on the internet, yet another technological, you know, kind of d defining moment, um, has totally reshaped the industry uh, beyond recognition. Uh, now people receive pennies sometimes, you know, they get like a check for 20 cents mm -hmm. uh, on their residuals, right? This was the big uh, conundrum for the, the Screen uh, Actors Guild and also for the Writers Guild. Um, but there's also the additional piece of artificial intelligence, right? Uh, you know, the use of uh, artificial intelligence for voiceover, for creating characters, right? Um, even writing scripts. Um, and a parallel here is um, the UAW uh, right now on strike. Uh, biggest, you know, uh, union, at least one of the most powerful in the country. And uh, what are they asking about? They're asking about two things. One, you are stripping down the machine that we've been building for you know, a couple centuries now uh, into parts that uh, essentially will take away jobs. We'll eliminate jobs from the, from the line. Um, but two, you're also using artificial intelligence. You're creating potentially barriers uh, for us to uh, get skilled up. And one of my big bugbears, when I hear here in Washington uh, on the Hill, we, we could just, you know, artificial intelligence is going to be fine. We can just reskill everybody. <laughs> it's going to be good. Let's talk a little bit about the workforce impact of AI, um, and not just in the United States, I really like globally. Um, what can we expect to see from that? And I'm going to go to Nanjira, yeah. uh, and then you, Rohinton, and, and Alejandro. I think it's, it's going to be a mixed bag. Um, I'm, uh, if I may focus on how we're seeing it, at least with the conversations on the future of work or the present of work in Africa. Before we even talk about the artificial intelligence side of it, it is just workforce precarity exists, as it were. Younger and younger populations that are not easily absorbed into the economies as they're structured, what do you do with that workforce? Um, and then they're also the source of cheap labor to power the data labeling and the sort of the concept of data janitorialism has come up because they're being, this work is being outsourced to the Kenyas and other space in Morocco and elsewhere to train Chad GPT and other models on this is an image of a human and this is not. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, you can't even see yourself represented in the outcome. There's a story just this week about generative AI refusing to generate an image of a black, an African doctor with patients. It just could not. It could not consider an African doctor. It could only consider a doctor to be a white person. And then at some point, when probed further, it decided it preferred to show a giraffe with children <laughs> rather than an African doctor with children. Wow. So you've worked on this end to train these models and then they're not even seeing you. They're not representative of you. Um, there's, there's that aspect of just the long chain of injustice there that could, is, is unfolding. Um, there is the question about creativity and where skilling comes in because a lot of what people are starting to, consensus is starting to generate is that on technical jobs, just everyday paper punching, pushing, there could be ways where artificial intelligence does better, quote unquote, 
but that's a question of where those people will be taken, those who have those jobs. So I think the fact that that's a conversation and a concern around the world means that for the first time in a long time, we'll have to go back to the books on what labor and worker rights have been, all these things we've written through ILO, International Labor Organization, and other spheres. What will that mean? And that will call for planetary uh, solidarity. Mm -hmm. Because the worker who's precariously suffering at UAW and the construction worker um, down on the, in the continent who's trying to get, you know, that's to sustain them as a living, but you know, I don't know, development money brings you a robot to build your infrastructure there. there there's, a, there's something there that ties them. And that future, the fear that we don't know where people are going to have sustainable jobs, at least allows us not to see it as all oh, AI doomerism, but to start speaking about what will solidarity look like in saying whether it's reskilling of workers or whether it's ensuring that the pace at which these technologies are introduced does not upset systems. Mm -hmm makes us at least have room for a new conversation. I mean, Rohinton, does that scare you? Because it scares me. Because I, you know, when you think about the folks who are in charge of regulation, right? people that you've dealt with, uh, you continue to deal with, are they ready for what was just described here? Um, you know, since the Industrial Revolution, the, sort of the path to prosperity and development has been to move from agriculture to low-end manufacturers and then up that value chain. That's how Britain, Germany, and France did it. That's how the tigers in East Asia did it. Uh, and that's how the current, you know, that's how Vietnam sees its future in Burma. Now think about that. Suppose you're Kazakhstan or Ethiopia or Tunisia, where you haven't even reached that middle stage. And more and more of the tasks are being automated at the low end. Some of us think about 40% of them have. So that entry level and that middle level step that you need to become um, something else just isn't going to be available. It's already not been available. Now, we're not supposed to bring slides, and, and I, I'm not a PowerPoint fan, but there's, there's one I'd like to show, which is the photo of, I think it's Nike, that reopened its first plant in Europe some years ago after moving all these operations to Asia over the years. And it's the photo of the shop floor. And all it is is robots. I mean, uh -huh. so you can, you know, you can reshore and all of that, but it's just not going to be like it used to be. Mm -hmm. So the employment absorption, and, and then the question becomes, as you were saying, well, are we going to revisit the labor leisure trade-off? Will jobs look different? Will we work less? All of the above in countries that have the social systems and the humanities to not just retrain people technically, mm -hmm. but to actually have people think about digital literacy and, and what it means to think in a different era. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot, large part of the world, one-fifth of the world, does not have meaningful or any privacy or data legislation. So the soft infrastructure you need to deal with all of this change just isn't there. Mm. And so uh, I think this worries me a lot. And I don't think it's enough to assume away the, I mean, I, I have great sympathy for the strike in Hollywood, but that's, that's just a microcosm of what others are going to face. And I don't think, as some of my economist colleagues do, one can assume this away by saying, all of this wealth be cre can be created. If we can simply redistribute it, we will all be doing other funkier things. <laughs> I think we have to have that conversation in a more granular way. And, and it will happen, but it's not happening quite yet. Other funkier things. Thoughts? Well, um, so I, I, I put this, uh, I mean, I, I agree we have a huge problem. And I think that uh, putting a few drops of skepticism on some of the grand statements can help us <laughs> reanalyze these things without denying the, the seriousness of the problem. Actually, it may, it may even underline how bad it is. So I'll use two very simple guidelines. One of them, uh, about 30 years ago, Peter Cauchy, who was a professor at uh, UCSD, and Jonathan Aronson in, I think, UCLA, uh, did a lot of very good work on the trends in technology and its governance. And one thing that they remarked, uh, and many others in, in technology actually know this by heart, it's what happens, <coughs> is there's a huge trend to miniaturization and modularization of stuff. And that's been a long, long term, and that's what Rohinton was already mentioning. You know, it's, uh, you know, first you replaced humans with machines, then machines became bigger, and then at some point machines, uh, like, and, and I mean, steel mills, 
broke down and you had smaller steel mills substituting for them and you could now place them in more, more countries and so forth. So that, that's a trend that uh, it's made by humans. Humans have decision power over it, but so far it has worked more like tectonic plates. It's, uh, the, all the humans that have, have been in the position to make a decision, they've made decisions that go in this trend. We didn't see in Hollywood uh, camera, uh, camera persons strike, uh, camera operators or photographers strike against Apple when they introduced a smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> Yet it was, and it may have taken a lot of camera jobs away, but it also produced a huge world of short films, of films made with a single camera on a, on a small tripod, remotely controlled from, uh, from, from, from a laptop or uh, with, with another similar camera. Uh, these are trends that uh, suddenly are hitting, uh, and this, I will say this tongue in cheek because we are that, uh, hitting the manifesto writing class. So our manifestos are now going to be written by artificial intelligence. <laughs> And they are going to be read by an artificial intelligence. My favorite take on the, this whole LLM revolution, ChatGPT, is guys in, in one room saying, I have a script that I tell them one word and it writes a beautiful uh, email. And the guys in the other room are saying, I have a script that gets this huge worthy email and tells me in one word what it means. <laughs> and that's you know, again, it's illuminating, it's throwing light on how we are doing, how we're working. Writing blurbs for, uh, for ads is a huge waste of intelligence in the sense that you can have 99% of the words in the blurb written by a machine. Uh, so what's the genius there? Maybe just distilling it into one picture now? Uh, so uh, the other guideline for me, and it comes together, is the cost of not doing. And this goes especially for country, developing countries, developing economies. Uh, we have legislators feverishly writing re laws against or for regulating uh, artificial intelligence. In, in the Mexican legislature alone, there are already 16, 13 initiatives for cybersecurity. And this semester, we are seeing already 15 or so for artificial intelligence. Why aren't these legislators, why weren't, where were these legislators when they could have allotted 5% instead of 0.1% of the national budget for education and research? Mm. We are paying the cost of not having done the job that we should have done or that our people in government should have done 20 or 50 years ago to level the playing field. We have very smart people from every developing country doing fantastic work in artificial intelligence, in Google, in Meta, or in Alibaba. Yeah. Not in country. Mm -hmm. So that's actually, so you bring me to the next question, which is on scripts, uh, but related to this, of course. You know, we've, um, Ian Bremer wrote this fantastic piece in Foreign Affairs, I guess it was last year, um, talking about sort of our techno-polar moment. moment. Uh, and I think we can all sort of acknowledge that, you know, Meta and Alibaba, uh, you know, Alphabet, these, these are not countries, these are not corporations, um, these are becoming empires uh, and that own um, whole parts of the virtual world, but also whole parts of the earth. Um, and with that high over-concentration of power, uh, we see challenges with data access, um, control, uh, you know, bringing value from your own data. In Nigeria, you were just sort of referring to that. Um, we've talked a little bit in, in our Digital Futures Task Force about how to break through the challenge of the Global South in particular, um, gaining more control over data access, um, for fending against internet shutdowns, uh, any answers? One, any answers in the form of an institutional um, or coalition building um, response beyond just sort of like, oh, I think it would be better if it was good. <laughs> what can we do um, institutionally um, or in some sort of coalition format to sort of respond to uh, this inequality of data access and data control? 
I'll let anybody jump in. <laughs> On the inequality of data access and control, there's two ways I like to think of it. There's this moment now where these models are learning faster what they can learn based on a very limited archive of which they're being trained. So there's a quest to get more data, so diversify the data sets. So the rush to get more languages, more contexts, more realities that haven't been included is happening. But in so doing, it's a very extractive model that's starting to emerge that isn't so much trying to work within the context and actually register those dividends as distributed equally then. It's almost like let's extract them, you know, get them to this center, and then maybe some trickle down aspects will happen. So for example, with trying to get more languages to train chat GPT and others, in, you know, in the endangered uh, languages are, are an interesting one because you can have these tools help redistribute, the, redistribute them in the archive or maintain an archive of them to be learned. But there are communities now pushing back and saying those benefits first have to come to us before they go up there, chat GPT, open AI, somebody makes all the profits a new script <laughs> on a storyline um, that's a lived reality um, and, and bring it back. So there are these interesting conversations about how do you go from the least connected to the overly connected, what's the through pass there in distributing um, equitable gains from these technologies rather than waiting for this increasingly unaccountable force that is the private companies that are running this across the board to maybe redistribute back through philanthropy or through uh, social enterprises or corporate social responsibility. And even where governments are not the ones stepping in, which is the, the case in most places, that people power, this questioning power is a really interesting impulse that for me is less about, the big question has been do we start reforming institutions that are or build new ones. And in between that, before that happens, is where will people be represented either way? Because we tend to ossify things through institutions, right? Um, but there's the dynamism of who's needing to be represented there that may not be represented in these institutions, whether we start afresh or whether we reform quickly. So there's the thinking of how to govern in agile ways that needs to pair up with the conversation about what are these institutions that are representative planks for us to have global tables, so to speak. Um, but the world isn't waiting for that, you know? People are actually seeking, you know, justice and equity now, not in the lifetimes to come. In Africa, we used to be told we, the young people are the future. I've, I'm done being young, I'm still not the future, right? <laughs> so the next generation is watching that. There's an urgency, I like to say, there's too many people living in the age where the cans that were kicked down the road are right here. So, they're not waiting for us to have the neat conversation that is ordered about UN reform. It's about right now we are speaking, we are saying this is how we're organizing, this is how we are trying to find ourselves represented. How can they be supported is just as important a conversation than, as the reform one of these institutions. So, I mean, here's the irony. You, you mentioned data inequities and so on, but way more people live in developing countries than in developed countries. Data is set to be the new oil. It's the raw material, and people think of it as a fifth factor of production now. It's the raw material for all of these things, AI and, and digitization that you're talking about. So if the assets and the raw materials are where they are, there's ways to conceive of that institutional response. I think if companies are using data that's generated in the global south, then a small step forward, a very small, but at least it's a step forward, is the tax treaty that we've seen, the G20 and OECD broker, in which um, big digital platforms have to pay a minimum tax and cannot finagle, legally finagle their accounts to pay taxes in low tax jurisdictions. That's a good start. Um, at CG, where, where, uh, which I used to lead, as you mentioned, uh, we, we did a lot of work on what are called data trusts, okay? Just as you put your savings dollars in mutual fund X and not Y because you like its portfolio and its rate of return, think about all the data that we generate and that belongs to us as individuals. You could think of data trusts as being national or sectoral as Nanjira and I who sat on a Lancet Commission on Global Health um, proposed, but there are ways to deposit data for uses that you want and then the monetized or non-pecuniary benefits from data trusts 
go to the shareholders, the people who contributed their data. So there's ways of thinking of this. And the final point I'd make is, you know, just as after the financial crisis in 2007 and 8, we recognized that the troika of the World Bank, IMF, and WTO was not up to the task of dealing with financial sector instability. That was just not something that could have been conceived of in 1944. We created the Financial Stability Board, which is a multi-stakeholder of group that hasn't made financial systems perfect, but it's many steps in the right direction. And again, at CG, we've proposed something called the Digital Stability Board as an overarching multi-stakeholder. I mean, that's one thing we have to get away from national governments only. Inclusivity cannot just mean having more and more small countries. We have to think about science ethicists, consumer groups, um, industry indeed, coming together in an institution where best practice is exchanged, where there is adjudication of disputes, and some of these inequity issues can actually be dealt with through that as well. So, you know, we're far from it, and as Nanjira said, it may not happen as fast as some of us would like while we're still young, <laughs> but um, that's where the future lies. Alejandro, I see you writing a novel over here. What's happening? I'm taking careful notes because I, they, they, they give me anchors for what, you know, to, to build upon what uh, has been said. Um, it's, it's almost uh, as, as, you know, what you have just said is the paragraph I would like to have quoted before what I'm going to say now. So it's fantastic. Feel free. Uh, uh, so quoting the, the, the previous speakers, uh, we have, uh, first, I've heard uh, in many fora, uh, among others, the Global Partnership for AI and uh, an initiative by, uh, led by uh, Dr. Paul Toomey, which is called the GID, which is a, a very interesting initiative to look at legislative and other solutions for data control, for individuals regaining data control. Uh, the, the idea of data commons or data trusts has come up. I still have a lot of questions about how they could actually be built mm -hmm. and governed. They would have to form a sort of labor union of, uh, or consumer union. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have all the questions about how to build that representation, keep it away from capture, from corporate or governmental cop, uh, capture and so forth. But that's an idea that's floating around. At any rate, I think that we have uh, good precedent to look at in the almost 30 years that internet governance has been a field or a thing. Uh, what we have been able to build in the internet governance field is organizations, institutions, and mechanisms, because governance is not always you know, about written rules, uh, that manage these shared resources. Uh, ICANN is uh, one example that's one of the most formalized. It has a dispute resolution uh, procedure that's uh, very detailed and uh, it has a lot of chances for redress of uh, wrongs and so forth. It's fully multi-stakeholder. It really brings together governments. Actually, one of the curious things that uh, bothers some people in, in, in ICANN is that the governments sit in an advisory role. They have an advisory, a government advisory committee. It has special powers. It can stop things almost totally cold on the tracks, but it's uh, an advisory committee. Uh, just as, a, as an anecdote to tell you how this came to happen, that uh, reform that we made in ICANN in 2003, we offered the government representatives to study a change in the structure where the government advisory committee would actually sit five directors by election uh, in, in the board of directors of the corporation, or three. Uh, it took them about 30 minutes to reject the offer <laughs> because they said first, uh, we would become liable for any uh, litigation that this organization goes into. And we as rep government representatives cannot be part of a litigation in a private, uh, even if non-profit organization. And the second one was some of them said in very low voice, there's no way we could agree, get 240 governments to agree on five representatives, even if it were regional. So this has been a very healthy structure. And what we see is other multi-stakeholder organizations working in the internet governance field. Uh, ICANN is very formalized. It has a large budget. It has formal meetings three times a year in different countries. Uh, and it has, as I said, all these teeth for uh, things that go wrong with uh, the central part of the domain name system. Everything else is decentralized. You have something called the anti-phishing working group, 
which is a very lightweight organization, it's mostly meetings and communications, led by a guy called Peter Cassidy, who's a former FBI accountant kind of person. Uh, the, it brings together police forces, uh, law enforcement. Uh, it brings together the banks where the assets are. That, and, and now, of course, there are many other non-financial assets, like you know your Netflix account. So everybody that sort of puts together or has to hold a fence against phishing. Uh, and the platforms where phishing occurs, which is like the large email providers, large messaging providers, that's where the exchanges take place, which actually pull out people's resources. It's a very light organization, and it's done a lot of work that we don't see. You, the way we see that we don't see it is the huge decrease in phishing attempts you can get through email, for example, and the way you can make them decrease now in other messaging platforms. Uh, you can see that kind of, of stuff working in, in many ways. And I would not advise to just copy any of these organizations, but to learn the lessons from multi-stakeholder uh, uh, organizations or mechanisms in the internet field. And of course, look at the many others, like the Financial Stability Board. There's a lot of multi-stakeholder, even if it's not called so explicitly, in sports governance, in finance governance, sometimes inside countries, sometimes globally. And that would be a good field to a, bring in the, the learning into this other question. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, and I was going to say, I mean, but on where we are thinking about new global planetary uh, institutions, whether they borrow from the multi-stakeholder model, multilateral model, otherwise, one big thing that is emerging that is clear is it's something that has to get especially the big powers on the same table. So you need the US and China as super producers on the same table. What's happening all too often is there are new formations that are emerging that will almost always sideline one or the other. Mm -hmm. So you're finding maybe the Chinese, Ch Chinese group is organizing different stakeholders, the US group is organizing others. There's an interesting divide around digital authoritarianism, digital democracies, which are terminologies that don't fit neatly anyway. Mm -hmm that is not going to help us with where we need to be headed. Because at the end of the day, both powers in the quest to participate in geopolitical competition, including in technology, are rushing for that data. So if they come to a source that says the continent, and um, we have a saying, you know, when two bulls fight, it is the grass that suffers. Right. Uh, when your data is still being extracted because they're contending, uh, you know, real, uh, you know powers, and you're trying to get the resources to develop from either side without you know, getting caught up, you I think a policymaker is going to spend a lot more time fighting these you know, <laughs> little uh, tensions rather than actually pulling resources to work for them. Mm -hmm. So that's a reality we must not lose sight of, and especially here in DC, that whatever would be proposed as international absolutely has to get the other powers that are creating these technologies in the same room to find some rules of the road. Yeah, I'm so glad you raised this. I mean, at the risk of offending um, most of Washington, D.C. and most of the White House just down the street over here, I will say I am extremely pleased to see the fading away uh, of uh, that initiative uh, whereby, um, you know, there was this sort of we are the authoritarian versus the, yeah. the great democracies because obviously we know uh, we're all in trouble, right? I mean, democracy is in trouble everywhere. Um, authoritarianism is everywhere. Um, and it doesn't neatly sort of um, you know, sit with inside uh, any particular set of borders, as it turns out. Yeah. Um, and we're all struggling with these challenges, um, and they're, they're difficult, I think, to, to grapple with if we do have this kind of very binary approach. Um, I think we are at a point where um, questions from the audience would be very welcome, and I want to invite you to come up here and uh, make yourself known. Lots of um, good questions to, I'm sure, ask. Um, while I do, while I wait for somebody to step up to the mic, I'm going to just take the prerogative and ask a very quick question. We um, touched on uh, data sovereignty uh, in our conversations uh, in May, and um, I think that Mr. Drucker is going to address some of this. Um, I just want to touch on a little bit on the data sovereignty question. Uh, we've seen China. Uh, make bids in the ITU, Russia make I bids in the ITU. Um, I'll let you answer it and then we'll get to these questions. Right. Data sovereignty, do, what kind of stakeholder format would we need to really address many of the questions um, that are coming up there? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there are more questions we have to ask on what we mean by data sovereignty um, and whether we are resorting back to sort of jurisdictional sovereignty where your national government through data protection or privacy laws necessitates that certain data does not migrate from, uh, you know, so civil data, for example, is not transferred either through servers or extracted by companies. Is that the form of data sovereignty we're speaking of? Is it individual sovereignty? And how does that fit in a world where uh, rights are not just about individuals, but about communities, which is essentially what the African, you know, human and uh, people's rights charter talks about. It tries to balance the fact that you're an individual within a community, and that's a kind of corpus we haven't tapped into in finding other solutions. Too much of the focus on individual rights, the way the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has shown us, has limited us from thinking about other, other ways to do it. So a lot of focus from Europe and elsewhere is around protecting an individual, an individual protecting their data. But am I going to protect it from China, the US, my government, you know, the companies? How much is one individual capable of doing? And are we, sh are we selling ourselves short by still having a legal precedent that is being set through that model when we're talking about co a concept as tenuous as data sovereignty? Some might argue we don't even have the sovereignty of that data anyway. It's crossing all over the internet and the cables and all that jazz. Um, but I think it's a term that's being thrown around a lot without really contextualizing what that means without also creating what would be a protectionist uh, d d dimension. And I think uh, in others are also calling for cross-border data flows with trust, which just says there could be a version of it that doesn't have trust, um, which tells a lot about the fact that we just need to sit more with that question and hear perspectives from different regions on what people are thinking and collectives. So I think there's work there to be done, more work to be done. Always with this quick answer, I like it. All right, um, questions from the audience, sir. Steve Crocker. Um, I'm going to make an old guy's comment uh, that'll make uh, Alejandro look like a youngster. 50 years ago, and a little bit more, I had a job at uh, DARPA writing the checks to support the artificial intelligence research program. Um, and, so, and, and the challenge at the time, as a youngster then, was how do I write the justification for the work we're doing? Because typically DARPA programs in those days were five-year programs, and I knew for sure that we were in for a 50-year uh, process of trying to build AI. So I look at the current controversies about AI today, and I say, yeah, this is great. We got there finally. But <laughs> as you commented, we're going to go a little bit further. We may go a whole lot further. And so a lot of the commotion of the moment is really of the moment. And you haven't seen anything yet in a way. Mm -hmm. um, a particular data point uh, or prospective data point, I was talking to Raj Reddy last year about the uh, progress in speech understanding. So this relates to both in a positive and negative way about uh, preservation of languages and so forth, and asked uh, what his prediction was about the ability to have real-time translation uh, in language so that we could each speak in our own native languages and be understood in equality. He said he had put himself on record a year earlier, so that's two years ago, that in 10 years, eight years from now, 100 languages, facile, real-time translation. Maybe it'll happen in eight years, maybe it'll take a little longer, but, but and, and it was an informed, I can tell you, if you don't know who Raj Reddy is, a very, very well-informed uh, opinion. Um, let me set that aside and, and bring in a different aspect. Um, a lot of attention to the displacement of uh, jobs and um, uh, increase in inequity in wealth and uh, control. I'm not an economist, so I'm going to make amateur comments here. Wealth is roughly, in, in my uh, limited perspective, divided up into what are your skill sets in terms of individual labor, what assets do you control, and <coughs> related but slightly different, what f facilities, organizations, and so forth, what your power structure is. And we're seeing shifts in all of this. And, but if you stand back and look at it, I say, well, what's the wealth of a nation? And one can imagine, now moving into sort of semi-science fiction territory, that if instead of valuing what a person can do to create uh, income for himself or herself, what a, a, co a country or a people can do to create um, the means of support and uh, uh, 
prevention of uh, disease and all sorts of things as a community, then <coughs> you have different ways of approaching how you distribute the, the benefits of that wealth, and that leads to political uh, uh, issues of um, do you have uh, capitalism or do you have socialism, etc. And I don't want to take a position on which of those needs to be the best. I suspect that there's no perfect answer, and any extreme is 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 wrong. So, but my putting that together with my uh, other point is that things are changing, and. And, and here's the devilish problem. Things are changing at different rates. Mm -hmm. The Westphalian uh, uh, order of things preserved and created a lot of order in the world, in, in a sense, um, and also hardened the interactions so that it, it made nation states the primary way of organizing things around the, the globe. Now we're in a state where, uh, a situation where problems are besetting the planet that aren't simply every, every country should do for itself what's best. There's common things, and our institutions aren't naturally set up to create the kind of uh, uh, cooperation and uh, common action that's needed. And meanwhile, we have in the technology, we have very rapid changes in computing and AI now and so forth. Uh, things are changing at very different rates here. And so that, to me, is the big challenge. And we can have local focused solutions on how do we can apply AI, how we could regulate AI for facial recognition or surveillance and so forth. Not unimportant, but from a slightly broader perspective, almost a passing challenge that will be overtaken by the things. Pardon for the long. That's OK. And there's a question in there somewhere. OK, I'm sure there's a question in there. Um, and I know that there's a question behind you. Uh, and we've got about three minutes. So what we're going to do is take the, the two questions, um, and we're going to make you do um, kind of like quiz show style. You get 30 seconds to answer them. Go. All right, so we have a question from the online audience. Uh, what do the panelists think of the problem of junk data, the idea that AI will flood the internet with generated low value content, which makes it harder to find useful and original information? Is there a future where only the relatively rich can afford quality data? Ooh. Oh, that's a good question. Junk data, OK. Hello, uh, Musa Siddiqui from United Nations University. and. So AI is a tool, and it's up to us to decide how to wield it. So it leads to benefits, but it also leads to consequences that need to be mitigated. So two questions on that. Firstly, when it comes to the development of AI, how can we develop effective public-private partnerships to ensure that the development is in alignment with the values of the international system, for instance, respecting human rights? And the second question, which is something that you actually mentioned, Nigeria, which was talking about the need for agile governance and the question of do we stick to existing institutions or create new institutions? So any ideas on how we can make these institutions more agile, given that you know they're 20th century institutions dealing with 21st century challenges. Thank you. Great question. I'm going to summarize um, as best I can uh, so we can get 30 seconds out of you each. So I think what I heard was one uh, from Mr. Drucker, things are moving fast. Um, we're not skating to the puck, basically. How do we skate to the puck? That's number one. Number two, is it only the rich people out here who are going to be able to open their email uh, and feel okay about it? Um, or is it, is it going to be all the rest of us, um, you know, are we going to keep getting, you know, uh, junk data, junk uh, email, junk, junk, junk? Yeah. Um, what's the solution there? Uh, and last but not least, uh, I'm just going to go to the agility part because actually I think that's undervalued and uh, not talked about enough. Um, how do we make our response and our institutions more agile uh, when it comes to looking at the artificial intelligence challenge? You have exactly 30 seconds, go. <laughs> oh, I think that uh, I, I just, just one part of this, which is the question about whether old or new institutions. Uh, I think that it will be solved, it will be answered by first answering what problems, plural, uh, we can try to solve. Uh, we may be leaving some problems unsolved in, in the world, that's the history of humankind, but define a problem that brings together a group of stakeholders. You asked about private, public-private partnerships. That's exactly what multi-stakeholder means. Uh, find the problem, find who are the interested parties, and if there are harmed parties, find a way to bring the harming parties to, to the table. 
Uh, just a thir uh, five seconds. Thanks to the interpreters, the sign language interpreters, we've made your afternoon uh, very physical. Indeed, <laughs> they are fierce. Yeah, I think the junk data point it broader speaks to divides. And I think we're first approaching a new kind of divide where there'll be those of us majority who are connected and those who are disconnected are either those who are never connected or those who can pay their way out. So because the a vast majority of us are being shepherded into this space where even opening an app that previously used to give you information, you have to sift through all that, the junk that was rightfully mentioned to find one gem of insight. But there are people who are able to afford to pay their way out of these systems. For some, you know, it's important to remember that there's also a form of coercion to use these tools uh, where we rely on them. A reliance has been generated and then um, Cory Doctor calls it entitification of these apps where you first, it, it gives you a service, it's a valuable service and then it flips it on you and then keeps you locked in and you don't know how to find your way out easily. So there are these divides and they're going to keep shifting. Uh, we have to keep an eye out for that um, and figure out some rules before it's too late for everybody. Not to name names, but I feel that way about Gmail. Go. <laughs> I think DARPA and your space program are shining examples of how public investments re generate both public and private wealth. And so if we think about technology as being created not by free markets, but by public action, then the intellectual property that's created by technology should be seen more of a pub as more of a public good than we currently do. Our currents of IP regimes and trips and so on take us in the wrong direction. And so many of the points you made lead me to think that taxing the profits of um, the rents that accrue from technology so that governments can provide their citizens the things that they're meant to provide is the future of public policy. Mm -hmm. And on the middle point, um, you know, think of a continuum from data to information to knowledge to wisdom. And um, I don't think there's any algorithm yet that gets us as cleanly to that as the human brain. Mm -hmm. But where the money will be and where the action will be is to sift through the noise and the data and information to knowledge and wisdom. And that's what we should be, again, directing public action at. Hmm. Rohinton, you are now my favorite. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> um, and I'm glad. The award of <laughs> You're all my favorite. Uh, let's Ooh. give the, audience, the, the panelists a, a hand here. Um, I thought it was an excellent discussion. Thank you. Okay, so thank you to Candice, Rohinton, Alejandro, Najira for that, that excellent conversation. Um, our next and final panel is titled Climate Change and Financing a Just Transition. Uh, our moderator is Planetary Politics Director Hila Rasul Ayoub. Uh, Hila runs at Planetary Politics a body of work we call Power Reimagined, uh, which focuses on uh, decarbonization and financing a just energy transition um, around the world. Um, Gila was previously a foreign service officer with USAID, uh, where she had extensive experience working with multilateral institutions. Uh, she held positions such as the Director of Global Engagement on the National Security Council for a while, uh, and she was a director of the Office of Development Coordination at USAID. Uh, she is a lawyer by training, um, and she worked also as an investigator with the World Bank's Integrity Vice Presidency, going after corruption and bad actors in the World Bank system. Uh, so, without further ado, I will turn it over to Gila. Thanks, Gordon, and welcome, everybody. We are so glad to have you join us for this all-important conversation um, and discussion on the planetary climate crisis and the need to center historically marginalized frontline communities in climate policy and financing discussions. Like no other time in recent history have those of us in the global north and wealthier nations faced the ravages of the climate crisis in the way that we did this summer, the hottest summer recorded in history. But frontline communities, those communities that have been facing the impacts of the climate crisis, be it through devastating floods, hurricanes, droughts, they've been telling us for a long time that while they are on the front lines right now, the crisis will come to us all. 
So as such, the discussions and policies that are drawn up need to center those voices and experiences to come up with solutions that will benefit the planet as a whole. So it gives me immense pleasure to introduce our incredibly illustrious panelists today. Um, next to me, we have uh, Dr. Saeed Muhammad Ali, who is a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute, lecturer at the Advanced Academic Programs at Johns Hopkins. He has also ha done consult uh, extensive consulting work with the United Nations, CARE International, among other international bodies. Um, he is a, a regular contributor to the Express Tribune, an affiliate of the New York Times in Pakistan. He has taught international affairs, international development, and anthropology courses in Australia, Pakistan, and the United States. So welcome, Dr. Ali. And then we have um, Heather McTeer. Tony, I'm very glad to introduce her. She is the executive director of the Beyond Petroleum Chemicals campaign. She is also the author of the book, Before the Streetlights Come On, Black America's Urgent Call for Climate Solutions. Uh, she um, was also appointed by President Barack Obama uh, within the EPA and has previously served as mayor to Green, uh, at Greenville, Mississippi, um, one of the youngest mayors at 27. Um, and I just learned in the green room, they have a sister city in Liberia. And so um, that's always wonderful to see. And then on the screen here, um, we are very glad to have join us uh, Camila Camillo. Camila is a, an activist out of Brazil. She's a social entrepreneur building bridges between large organizations and grassroots initiatives to develop open innovation projects social responsibility strategies within the ESG agenda, and initiative focused on climate action. After five years of engagement with communities in the Amazon rainforest as a volunteer on social projects, she founded the Creators Academy Brazil, a community of content creators who amplify the agenda of protecting Brazilian biomes. She is also a contributor um, to the Agarape Institute, a think tank focused on public and digital security and climate governance. Also to the Angels of the City Association, which has been working with the homeless population, addiction issues, and restorative uh, justice for 35 years. So um, with that, um, I would like to quickly just jump into some questions. I've learned a lot from my boss in terms of going off script, so I hope that you all will join me for that ride. So we'll begin this discussion with a little bit of scene setting to understand both the depth and the history of the climate crisis for these frontline communities. And then we can move to some pathways for solutions and hopefully uh, identify some glimmers of hope. So I'll first turn to you, Heather. Um, in your book, Before the Street Lights Come On, you draw a clear line between the racist redlining policies, which continue to endure to this day, and African Americans increased vulnerability to climate change and climate disasters. From your work, what are the most pressing climate-related challenges faced by frontline communities in the US, and how do those challenges intersect with issues of social justice and economic justice? Well, thank you so much for that question, and thank you all for being here. It's certainly an honor, and I'm, I'm excited that we're having this conversation in a moment that's so critical to both uh, how we think about climate solutions in the future and, and, more importantly, how we engage people to be a part of that, because the conversation around just transition can't begin until we recognize that we have an unjust system. And that unjust system is what has put us in a position where we have communities, particularly communities of color and African-American communities in the Southeast, Southeast that have always existed in a space of being detrimentally, detrimentally and disproportionately impacted by climate and by um, large oil and gas and petrochemical facilities that have put themselves on the very footprint of plantations and of the enslaved system of the Southeast. So when you ask the question of what are these biggest challenges, they're all intersectional because we cannot silo these impacts to our communities. Uh, environmental health and the health impacts of people who live under a cloud of pollution, quite literally, uh, are also uh, a, a, a cumulative impact 
because just as we are experiencing the uh, health impacts of having distressed lungs, of seeing our children who have more impacts of asthma uh, and have more experiences of these, um, these very real and present health issues, they also overlap with education. Mm -hmm. They also overlap with the ability to sustain infrastructure in our communities. They also overlap with the economic development ability in a community. So the same experience of someone who is from Greenville, Mississippi, or from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or um, from Texas, uh, who is not able to go to work because they've got um, kids at home that have had to go to the hospital because they've got an asthma attack. Uh, we all know sick people can't work. And so if you're at home and you've got sick days and all of these things, again, are uh, continuing to bundle together, there's no reason for us to think that if we continue along that same strain, that we can have a just transition to clean energy without addressing these injustices in the past. And, and I'm really excited to think about what those solutions can be and how we do that together. Well, and we talked about this a little bit just now, but you know, there's the work that you're doing here in the US, but there are also opportunities to tie that to work that is being done globally, especially in the global south. So if you could share some of your experiences in trying to do that and where you see those opportunities bubbling up. There have always been connections between people across geopolitical borders. We've never been limited by what our governments are doing. Uh, I was sharing with you when I was mayor of Greenville, Mississippi, our sister city was Greenville County uh, in Liberia. And it was such an honor to know the history that people had between our communities. This little town in the Mississippi Delta that had uh, connections overseas. But that continues to this day. At Beyond Petrochemicals, we're very proud that we get to support frontline communities as they present themselves in the Global Plastics Treaty. So we'll be going and supporting them in Nairobi, Kenya when they travel in November and watching how these frontline communities, Fence Line Watch in um, Houston, Texas, Yvette Ariano, or the Descendants Project in St. Uh, St. Paul the Baptist Parish uh, in Louisiana, uh, Dr. Joy and Joe Banner, watching how they are able to, on an international stage, have deep conversation and share the stories and their real lived experience of what it means to live right underneath of these facilities, it bears such resemblance to the exact same experience of people who are living in other countries. And it's those stories that is really moving how our governments are deciding where and what we're going to do to reduce plastics uh, globally, uh, how plastic pollution should be addressed, and then what are the steps to ensure economic viability of our communities globally moving forward. It's the people's story that, that's moving this action. And I think that's when we put that emphasis and put economic development along with that, we really begin to see significant change for our future. Thank you. I mean, and you know, this leads me to kind of your background in this work, and especially in Pakistan, Dr. Ali. You know, looking at global discourse on these topics, there have been conversations on how the transition to renewable energy has the potential for and is already leaving behind those in low income or emerging economies in particular, that these countries don't have adequate access to financing needed for the transition. And that even so, the shift to renewables could be detrimental to their human and economic development needs. But how do those who are in the seats of power take in that discourse? Is it being taken in? And if not, what opportunities are there for these communities to insert themselves? Well, I think that discourse is, uh, I, I do agree that, I mean, they're are, we live in a world with unjust systems, and uh, I, I think those discourses are not only uh, not being, you know, uh, dealt with adequately within the global south, but they are, um, you know, I mean, those discourses also generate uh, largely from the global north as well. And, uh, you know, I mean, there is something about these, like, asymmetrical, I mean, I, I know we've discussed uh, um, the idea of international financial institutions earlier, but, you know, there is something about the market mechanism when it intersects with power, for instance, right, or, or, or deprivation. And it creates these asymmetries, right, which, which are not, uh, you know, which are not unique, which are not um, uh, rare, 
I mean, they, they happen frequently. I mean, they happen even in the global north if one looks at the inequities. I mean, uh, on, on paper, this may be the land of opportunity, but we know that social mobility and because of historical reasons and, and so many other factors um, uh, that, that we don't see a level playing field. And similarly, I think in, in those parts of the world as well, uh, you know, there are, so in Sindh, for instance, uh, with this whole idea of like carbon trading, there's, there's uh, you know, there's the idea of, uh, of um, investing in the mangroves, mm -hmm. which seems like a, a great idea, but you know, that investment, um, when it's done in this, um, you know, in this exclusionary sense, uh, denies local uh, indigenous communities, fisher folk, mm -hmm. uh, you know, access to mangroves because they are, they are initially sam uh, saplings, uh, you know, and, and they have to be looked after. So it creates, you know, uh, further exclusion and then alongside that exclusion, I mean, you have trawlers now uh, deep, deep, deep sea fishing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, you know, often in, in the, the, the solutions that one sees unfolding on the ground, there seems to be two steps forward, but also certainly one step back. Yeah, for, uh, uh, sure, and I know that, you know, I have discussed, you know, the new resource curse that is, uh, you know, being faced, especially in the move to renewables. So how do you see communities responding to this new resource uh, curse, especially those marginalized communities in, in the global south? I think there's some level of agitation, but, you know, even in, in, in the politics, I mean, for Pakistan, for instance, I mean, the last prime minister uh, sort of, you know, uh, jumped on, on, on the bandwagon and, and rightly so of trying to do forestation. Big, you know, the, the, the tree tsunami, he called it. And he got international attention as well. But that is also then happening alongside these urban industrial projects which are quite detrimental. So trying to build a, a new, uh, you know, create this new riverfront on the Ravi River in, in the city of Lahore for instance, like this huge mega uh, project was quite problematic for a, a variety of environmental reasons and the dispossession that it was going to cause for the local communities. So I think that they, you know, I mean, w one can see some project-based, uh, you know, innovation. One can see people trying to be resilient in the way that people uh, are because, I mean, we have a tendency to cope with the circumstances that, that we find ourselves in. But they don't, you know, I mean, one doesn't see enough leverage being uh, exercised to be able to kind of push back on these ideas. So, you know, and, and as a consequence, we, we've seen uh, food hikes uh, uh, co, you know, coexist and, in fact, being encouraged by things like, you know, the move towards biofuels. Uh, we've seen, uh, you know, with, with cobalt, uh, what, what's happening with the mining of uh, cobalt in the DRC. Uh, we see now in Guyana, like Exxon moving in and then Guyana, because there's such a financial crunch, has to, you know, is thinking of that as an opportunity to invest in resilience. I mean, we saw in the COPs, uh, you know, how uh, there's all this emphasis on curbing emission, not emphasis on uh, enough emphasis on mitigation, right. uh, on loss and damage. I mean, that, that it's come out as a nice term, but one hasn't uh, seen, uh, you know, much action on it uh, thus far. And uh, with, with the new COP and where it's going to be, I mean, one, one wonders. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'd love to dig into that a little more in a bit, but I, I want to turn to Camila first. Um, Camila, I hope you can hear us um, and yeah. see it, uh, us in the room. But um, your work is driven by the recognition that the discussions around global climate policy making process have been very technical and quite, quite frankly, just inaccessible. You have personally walked away from a COP convenings feeling disenchanted, undervalued, and as a young person of color, from the global south. Do you see meaningful pathways for representation and what is lacking in these spaces? Well, um, yeah, I, I saw. I actually, I was like feeling in my skin during my first call. I was there and I was like, I wasn't understanding the conversation and it wasn't for lack of education but it wasn't because they chose to talk a language 
that isn't accessible for people like me. So I decide to ask the dumb questions during the session. And some of those folks there was like, oh, this is room is not for you. Uh, then I come back home and I think, okay, it, what is lacking is people like me earn a seat on the table. Because we are taking these streets. I was part of like one or two climate strikes during the call. But when we entered to the conference, I was like out of the conference. Like I was there like observing, but without any right to really participate and be heard. And I think like what we can do, especially uh, global North countries that are really committed with to a just transition is create more social participation, um, raise collective ambitions, like people on the ground, they are experiencing, and we have like a ton of methodologies to hear their experiences and stories and what they need. And also we have already the tools to measure how much money we need to address the solution. I've been heard a lot of discussions around mitigation, but now we need to face what is happening. Like we need to adapt. And like the global South countries, the developing economies, I felt that we are, we had like this willing to contribute, but we need to to be invited for the decision making tables. Um, I think many of initiatives led by youth they they are good to mobilize the society around the issues, but they still are not providing too much solutions because we don't have the opportunity to work on the solutions together. Uh, so I think it's our, it's our rule now, create these spaces when where like people, like youth driven projects or um, grassroots initiatives can be part of uh, the, the like the big picture plan, you know? Yeah. Uh, thanks for that, Camila. And that begs the question, you know, will you be going to the next COP? E okay, uh, <laughs> probably. I'm working on it. Um, but but I, I'm confused about the next COP a little bit, especially, in, well, after everything that is happening now, it's probably more that this COP we will address different topics than the like phasing out of fossil fuels, or uh, we probably will talk more about food systems, which is important as well. But uh, we, but some of the issues that we need to address now, because we are far away from the 2030. Um, metrics and, and goals. So like if we're not discussing phasing out fossil fuels and just transition from the ground, like, okay, we can go to renewable, but like how the communities feel uh, when the equipment get there, how their houses are like now. So yeah, like I think this COP is an opportunity for the global community to step up for a very serious conversation and get out of the probably um, corporate interest. Like we are not against people getting results, but first people need to be alive to get results after. There's certainly a lot of truth in that. Um, slightly shifting gears in a little bit, I know we laid the landscape a little bit in terms of like 
the direness of the situation. But as I was reading your book, Heather, um, I enjoyed it thoroughly. It was very, it was funny. <laughs> it was practical. Um, and it's always wonderful having things uh, to read that give, outline some concrete solutions. Um, you know, your book laid to bear some of the racist policies that were put into place that marginalized black and brown communities in the US but it offered solutions for the communities themselves, but for policymakers as well. Because I think, you know, so often we see the onus pushed on communities entirely. But one thing that you do know in your book is that when it comes to climate and environmental issues, while humanity is in the same store, we're not all on the same types of boats. Yes. Some are on yachts, some are not. That's right. So how do we get, maybe if not on a yacht, but Maybe a catamaran. Ah, that, uh, it's, I don't think we're ever going to get to a place, let me be clear, that everybody is in the same type of situation because that's just our reality on this planet. And the analysis that I, the, I mean, the analogy that I make is yes, we always, you hear this, we're all in the same storm together, we should row together. And I don't think that's quite true. We're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same kind of boat. And there are very privileged people in our world that are sailing on big, huge mega yachts, and they're able to weather a storm, while some of us are in little rafts and inflatables and, and little rowboats that are leaking. And when you think about that analogy, there is something we could do collectively, though, as we're in this storm together, if we have a sense of altruism, if we're really concerned about our fellow man and want to make it and survive. Um, it, it, it makes a difference if there are any people who are uh, water people uh, and, and have this experience. It makes a difference when you have a, a big boat that's able to block the wave for that smaller boat uh, and so that they're not feeling the impact because that big boat can take on that impact in a way that would toss those smaller boats. And that's what I think we have to think about when, we, when we're talking about solutions from the perspective of our policymakers and our communities and really get into the realistic elements of what will it take to really stop and protect people from this crisis. And my role at Beyond Petrochemicals, it's, it's, it's very plain. We're looking to stop the expansion of over 120 petrochemical facilities in the United States of America. And when you ask yourself, well, what, why? What's a petrochemical? Petrochemical is just oil. So we're in this conference talking about what is a just transition. It's not a just transition to more oil should be a just transition to get out of oil and gas. Yet, we have an industry that is beginning to tell people and convince them that you need more petrochemicals. You need more of plastic in order to survive the climate crisis. That's, again, just like the big yacht and the big mega boats telling the people in the small little tugboats, we're going to help you if we go way over here off to the side. That's not reality. Well, and it's, it's definitely not going to help us to solve a climate crisis. And just one more point, if you think about this too, um, with, with petrochemicals and, and really how we're like thinking about reducing carbon emissions um, throughout all of these industries. Petrochemicals are responsible for roughly 10% of carbon emissions now, and that's growing. So if you have an oil and gas industry that knows they're going to have to come out of what they're doing right now, and go into something else. It is also a natural assessment to understand what that will mean for the emissions, and as a result, what that continues to do for, to our climate crisis. And we can talk about, you know, a little bit later, how and what the solutions are, particularly for communities of color, but I think it's important for us to set the stage and understand what these impacts are and how we're all feeling them. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's an important point. This is a question for all of the panelists, actually, is the communications and the PR piece. I think research is showing now that um, the fossil fuel industry in recent years has made a strategic shift away from just outright climate denial and is, you know, to more nuanced messaging um, and discourses on climate delay. And so they're using these communities and as we talk about just transition, as we talk about socioeconomic transition, uh, the message that is going to these communities is that y there's no room for you in the renewable space. You're going to be out of jobs. So this climate discourse, it's really just for the elite, but they don't really care about your day to day. How do you see 
how do communities kind of, or the people who care about these issues, push back on this narrative, especially in light of the money, the sheer power that is behind this discourse? So I don't know who wants to start with that, but Heather, it looks like you've got some thoughts. <laughs> oh, I think to tell the truth, um, we were looking at a Chevron, um, a Chevron ad that came out a few weeks ago promoting CCS, carbon capture sequestration, particularly in the southeast and Louisiana area. And uh, the first image that came up after you see the Chevron logo is a picture of a black woman and she's running and jogging. And it's, it's like she's just happy, carefree, uh, beautiful, gorgeous, dark-skinned woman with AirPods and natural hair and a great outfit. And it just begs the question, what in the world does this have to do with protecting people uh, in communities? Why, wh wh what is this, this connection here? Immediately, personally, I felt it because I think black women are magical. But <laughs> obviously, uh, Chevron, too, thinks that we can use an image that it is resonating and right now is very powerful in so many different spaces to make people feel either comfortable or that they need to take some type of action. And that's not the reality in that particular community. It's certainly not the reality for the people who are living in a space where they are inundated with oil and gas um, facilities, but these are the very same facilities that are not putting the jobs in their communities. There's a great piece that was um, done just this past week. It, it appeared on uh, New Orleans radio, done by Floodlight News, that um, highlighted the fact that with all of the oil and gas industries that are in these areas, the percentage of jobs that go to black and brown and indigenous people just pales in comparison to the percentage to white people who are not even from the same space. So they're giving this message that they're bringing jobs into a community for people that make up 70% of the working population are people of color, yet they have less than, they have 19% of the high paying jobs. People who are, have the jobs, they're bringing from uh, other places. And then these same industries have the audacity to say it's because people are not qualified. So make it make sense to me. <laughs> Why are you gonna put a, a polluting industry into a place that you say is bringing jobs, but you're at the same time saying that people are not qualified for the job, so you have to bring somebody else in to do it, and the people who are living there are getting sick and are poor and are dying, and all of this is to say you're transitioning to something good. It doesn't make sense, and people who live there know it. Mm -hmm. And I think the more that we're able to tell this message and elevate the voices of people, these are the, the, the folks that are going to a cop. Mm -hmm. that need to, to be able to share and talk about this message because their experience is the same experience of our friends, our brothers and sisters that are in the global south. And, and while I think the industries often try, time, try to keep us siloed from one another, there is significant power in understanding that we have this shared experience, we need to talk about this shared experience, and then we need to push and advocate for the solutions that will rectify this. And let, let's just call a thing a thing. Mm -hmm. No, and you know, make sure the math maths. Make sure the math maths. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and a lot of this, and we've seen this, you know, growing up, you need to recycle, turn off your lights. A lot of the conversation and uh, the responsibility has been placed on consumers. Whereas when you, we really look at the numbers, when you look at the emissions overall globally, it, it, it doesn't make a difference. I can have my plastic straws, won't make a difference. How do you see this taking shape in the global south especially? And I think you know, with um, India's G20 presidency this last year, India was in particular very much pushing that, uh, you know, that model of responsibility on consumers and that shifts the attention away from the actual emitters. Absolutely, I mean, an example I like to use in the classroom, I must have heard it somewhere myself as well, is like, you know, the, the conscientious consumer. Mm -hmm. And the conscientious consumer is basically exercising conscientiousness uh, through the wallet. 
You know, I mean, I, I can be a very nice person, but, uh, you know, uh, if I don't have uh, the luxury of buying, uh, you know, a, a dozen eggs for six dollars, then, then I just have to put up with those caged chicken and, uh, you know, and, and that's the way it is. And I think that this is, it hasn't quite got on into, uh, you know, consumer markets in the global south where there's, initially there's more brand consciousness. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and then more basic issues like food adulteration. Mm -hmm. But even if it, but it does go, it has already penetrated there in other ways. So things like social entrepreneurship. I mean, it would be great if the whole world had social entrepreneurship and we didn't see the kind of exorbitant profit making that we do. And, you know, perhaps this idea of balancing multiple bottom lines at the same time. But the, but the way that uh, big business will endorse, right, uh, throw money at uh, social entrepreneurship, what it's doing is it's, it's making people who are at the bottom of the barrel clean up some of the mess to enable consumerism to exist as it does. So for instance, like things like I'm several, a few years ago, uh, something like the plastic bank, you know, got, got attention and, and the other models like um, uh, kabariwala.com, et cetera, in India. And you know, the idea is that you basically, uh, uh, you know, um, using economies of scale with scavengers essentially uh, to capture uh, waste plastic before it goes into the ocean and you monetize them, you know, where they get some, some cash or, um, uh, you know, other kinds of uh, goods for picking up, you know, people's plastic. Right. So, you know, it, it's a way, nice little way of sidestepping this huge plastic problem which is created by these beverage companies. I mean, on, uh, in another way, if you think of co-option, I mean, think of feminism co-opted and seduced by, by these forces. So, you know, just because a woman becomes a, a chief financial officer for a sugary beverage drink doesn't <laughs> do much for gender empowerment, mm -hmm. right? But it's presented as, as you know, this, this way of changing the world for the better. So I think these are, you know, I mean, these are the kinds of issues that um, are uh, in India now as it's aspiring to become the, the factory of the world. I mean, there has been, you know, a lot of research coming out talking about, uh, you know, the, the link between this kind of ultra-nationalist government and big money. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Adanis and, and, and whatnot. And I mean, this is, this is not only unique to India. I mean, here in the US or elsewhere, I mean, it, it's, it's a ploy used by populace where they deflect attention from the, from the stagnation, from the frustration of the ordinary man by pitting him against the other, right? So it's not your frustration as a, uh, as a blue collar worker, either you infuse that with a sense of nationalistic pride or turn it into the, the fault of someone else in some other country or some migrant who's stolen your job, right? So I, I, I think these are, uh, you know, I mean, and, and unfortunately, I mean, in a, in a town like this as well, we still see finger pointing mm -hmm. often, you know? So I mean, one thinks that, you know, there are enough of these discussions, but, you know, when I go to think tanks and, and, and you know, I, I work with as well, I don't see enough uh, self-reflection you know, or reflexivity as the anthropologists call it, like your own position, right. your positionality. So I, I, I think there's certainly much more room, uh, uh, you know, for that. I mean, b before we get to the positive. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I, if, if, if I may, I think that's it's such an important point that, that you're making because it's, also, it's, it's, it's normalizing this crisis and normalizing things that, in, in effect, the industry wants us to normalize so that they can continue to do the, the bad things that are happening. So, you know, this idea of, in the United States, having a, um, a, a, a touchy feeling about waste pickers because they're picking up plastics and, and we're saying, well, why don't you just get rid of the, all the plastics and pitting people one against the other? And I think it's, we should all be very careful about that. We should all be extremely careful about normalizing these things. We, we saw um, a report that came out uh, about two weeks ago that showed this 
a Swedish scientist who had come up as an art installation, this way to turn um, waste plastic into an, a flavored ice cream. Now, y yes, your face is exactly like mine was at the time. <laughs> Seriously, is this what we're doing now? Um, but this, it, it really begged the question of how much and how far are um, people willing to go to normalize some of these issues that are, are detrimental to our health, both physically and humanity, but also as a planet. And so these are the things that I think we have to talk about. Uh, it begs the question, where is the funding that really needs to come to communities to help us to come up with solutions, right? We talk, we talk about the solutions a little bit, uh, but it, we, we have right now venture capitalists the amount of money that venture capitalists have put into minority communities, the black and brown innovators and creators that are coming up with climate solutions. Again, that's a, a, it was 2% of all venture capitalists are funding black and brown inventors. That's a number that can change. That's a space where private equity and private business and dollars and investment can actually go to people who can create in the global south, who can create in the language and spaces that they know and the people and the culture that they know. And I think that's one of the things that we really need to look at in terms of creating shift and solutions. Well, I think that's where I would love uh, Hila, to... can I jump? Yeah, please. Uh, <laughs> Who is trying to come okay. up with that solution? I have like, yeah, I have like my two cents on that. Um, a few months ago, I was in a room with like over 300, 200 advertisers talking to them about regenerative communication. Um, because, yes, the industry, they have like the bad products or some stuff. But is the advertisement industry that is responsible for creating the desire for this overconsumption behavior. So if we don't w work on those that understand how the human minds work for the desire of a more sustainable way of living, we will continue um, with this blaming game to the individual's practices like putting in the individual side the responsibility for save the planet, but we need a system, systemic approach, and this and, and this like invites corporate governments and every, and everyone. But uh, when it comes to message, I've been seeing, especially here in Brazil, for example, some advertisers taking place of the technicians to decide ESG strategies. How, how is that possible? How is this happening now? When we have like, for example, I worked like last year in a project, was a um, very special project around like uh, circularity. And the company invests a certain, like a certain amount of money and five times more on the campaign to tell the consumers, what they do. So we know where the money is going. The money is going for campaigning greenwashing. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can go to the venture capital money, but also the companies has these big accounts of marketing to sell their reputation when they could use like part of these resources to uh, improve the community's work and like working on the negative impact they are causing. I think this is one thing. The other side, if we if we do a better stakeholder map, considering the I, ICLP, um, IPLCs, uh, indigenous people in local communities, and understand that sometimes they are not prepared like they, they, they don't have um, judicial structure, they, they don't have like a institution, but they are doing the groundwork. And, and is our like role working, how we can make them access resources, resources that is necessary. We can create uh, more modern and accessible ways 
to help them with their resources. And sometimes it's not like just money in their hands, but like sometimes it's actually like giving them back their lands. <laughs> I was in an event last week and there was people talking about regeneration. A lot of very rich people in a land that was indigenous land for like over a thousand years, but they buy everything and they are talking about a regeneration here. And I asked to them, are you willing to giving them back their lands? <laughs> Silence, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like we need, we need to make room. I think what my, my main solution is, who is the people that can hold space for the hard conversations happening, like and create some circles that we are working together, that we will working together until we get some solution. Uh, because we are like coming back to our rooms with the thoughts about the problem, but we are not bringing solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think this is what some of my thoughts around this. And I really think that the advertisement industry is a key to, to address, especially the individual's behavior. Thanks. And it is beyond the time for those hard conversations. But I also want to give some time for our audience here and our online audience for some questions before we close out the session. Please, Anne. Um, Anne Florini, Arizona State University and New America. I'd like to tie the discussion here back to our opening discussion because Bina asked what I thought was a really interesting question to the president on the connection between climate and democracy. And just as a little plug, there will be an event on climate and democracy in this room on November 7th to which you are all invited. But I'm, I wanted to tie it particularly, Madame Mir, to your point about where's the money and why is it not coming. But of course, right now, there's tens of billions of dollars coming out of the federal government 40% of which is supposed to go to the environmentally frontline communities um, under the Justice 40 initiative, which is a result of extremely effective political organizing by people from those communities over the last several years. In the United States, is there any evidence that that is potentially the beginnings of support to the communities that will both at the same time, give them the resources that they need, but also provide a focal point around which you can get rejuvenation of local democracy itself. And for the other panelists, is there any evidence that the climate crisis can have positive impacts on bottom-up democracy because it's forcing people to come together around a crisis? Or do we have democracy decay and the climate crisis reinforcing each other in a negative direction? So to answer your first question, yes. Uh, the Justice 40 and funding that came from, uh, from IRA, from the um, act that really allowed a lot of funding to go in these communities is absolutely having a tremendous impact already. Even though it had been, um, and, and we're still experiencing challenges just to make sure that funding is getting out to community and it's getting out to the right people. We certainly understand that the um, significant weight of EPA and DOE and the Department of Transportation and just the process of trying to do that has been extraordinary and I have to applaud them on the efforts that they've gotten. But we're just coming back from uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, the HBCU Climate Change Consortium with over 400 people from government agencies and nonprofits and, uh, and students alike where these are groups that are also benefiting from an EPA Thrive Grant. And this is how communities are coming together and having these conversations and bringing in people from all over the country to talk about the solutions. That's happening in part because of uh, additional funding that's coming through Justice 40. And, and uh, we just left and I saw a, a whole station from NASA that was set up here. Uh, again, in this space that was directly addressing and having these conversations with students on a level that we've never thought of before. So that first answer is yes, and we should all be empowered by that. The same time, we have to be very concerned because it is under attack. 
right now we have a representative, Representative Scalise, who is one of the people who is up for Speaker of the House that's coming from a constituency based in Louisiana that is facing extreme environmental challenges. There's salt water going up the Mississippi River. We just talked about that. And, and so the idea that we could be in a position with a federal government that is already um, right now uh, an administration that is doing their darnest to be able to uh, live up to the commitment of, of environmental justice as they stated when they began, uh, that's also fighting with uh, a, a legislative body that doesn't like regulation. So these communities need your help. They need your support. They need this advocacy. Uh, passing IRA was not enough. You can't pass it and don't support the entities and the communities that need to continue to see it done. So, you know, I know there was a lot of celebration after we got that finished, but there were folks that were saying, okay, now we need everybody to get down on the ground with us and keep pushing and keep fighting so that we can continue to have a flow of funding and we can leverage it and we can talk about private investment and we can begin really having, I think, more a global impact. That's the next level and next space where we are now. We have a, a very large question uh, from our global uh, online audience, which is that more and more the world seems to be retreating back into camps or zones of influence, which can only make global efforts to tackle problems like the climate crisis more difficult. Is there any way to reverse this trend, or do we have to figure out ways to work within this new system of essentially great power competition? I, I think that there's certainly, I mean, there is local resistance. Uh, you know, there's agency, there's solidarity, but it is David and Goliath. And I think that that big cruise ship or yacht does need to come to the fore. And I think in, in the geo uh, strategic space, what needs to happen, and we've been trying to push this through different think tanks, you know, the idea of China and the US, for instance, right? So I mean, th there was a time in the Nixon Nixonian era where uh, you, you know that rapprochement happened through Pakistan. It, it, you know, it's it's a roller coaster relationship. I'm, I'm uh, you know I'm aware of that as well. But there are possibilities in these you know countries to try and green CPAC, mm -hmm. for instance, right? For the US, and that would be the interesting possibilities there. Uh, I, I think now with the new uh, COP, I mean, Saudi is trying to, you know, has been in discussion with Pakistan to set up a $10 billion oil refinery, right? So, I mean, this set, you know, while it's trying to transition itself, you know, there is this fear that a lot of this obsolete, you know, uh, technology gets shipped off elsewhere. So, I think those are kind of the, the concerns and also the opportunities where, I mean, you know, and, and the possibility to leapfrog. I mean, if that can happen, but I mean, of course, it needs, uh, you know, it needs resource commitment and it needs a, a less um, acrimonious uh, engagement for which there are also vested interests. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we have one more question from our audience and then I think we'll have to close out the session. Um, hi, I'm Emily. I was uh -oh. one of <laughs> Saeed Mohammed's um, previous students. Um, at American University. <laughs> so my question is about um, activist movements um, like related to debt for climate um, exchanges from places like the World Bank and IMF. Um, there are a lot of people from the Global South that are calling um, for these larger international um, financing organizations to exchange or relieve debt um, because of the environmental degradation they have caused. So you kind of touched on this with um, the case of Guyana and um, they're sort of like, because of their debt, they're opening up more land for extraction from Exxon. Um, you see this with industrial agriculture in Costa Rica and different parts of the world all over. And so uh, I guess for all of the panelists, um, when it comes to financing a just transition, how do you see these kinds of debt cancellation um, actions? And that would be the most beneficial uh, way, way to go about it. Uh, I think you have to look at a, um, a, a, a body of financing. There's not going to be one particular avenue. And certainly as um, it, in, I think with, we have to look at this with, it, with the eyes of, of a financing perspective. Um, because while there's relieving debt, there's also making a profit. 
And so with every debt that's relieved, that's either coming off of someone's books or it is now giving an opportunity to create profit. So really profit is the end game, not just the debt relief. And when we think about that profit side of it and who is getting the profit and why and what is the purpose of it, is it really driving us to a space where, again, we're getting into a fossil fuel economy and we're moving into uh, a transition of renewable energy? I think that has to be a part of this debt relief conversation. For some countries and for some spaces, absolutely, because the debt relief allows them an opportunity to invest in some of the renewable options that they really are seeking to do. But in some spaces, yes, there's definitely a conflict. If um, the debt relief is associated with Exxon taking and getting rid of its old oil refinery stuff and then giving it to a space in a, uh, a, a country or an opportunity to not, ref not update it or upgrade it, then we have a bigger problem than what we started with in the first space. So I just think that there's a bit more to that question that doesn't only rely in relieving debt but must be married to the point of getting the profit and profit into communities that, that have historically needed it, but also are really looking to drive a renewable uh, economy for themselves. So debt relief in the sense of multilateral mm -hmm. debt, which would be, you know, I mean, it would be a tough sell for, for the um, lenders, but the possibility of climate debt debt swaps, mm -hmm. right? So, so channeling that relief, I mean, not so a minister can buy a Rolex, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, for, for, for useful stuff. And there are all these historical reasons for it and social justice reasons for it. Um, uh, but, yeah. I know I said last question, but I see that President Sirleaf has a question. So I want to give. Thank you. I don't really have a question, but I want to make a statement, and maybe that might inspire others to respond to that. Uh, everyone knows that power diversity is concentrated in the global south, mm -hmm. mainly in the form of forests, large forests. Forests have been used as a source of livelihood for communities. There have been a movement of trying to make sure that the preservation of forests are maintained uh, in response to give some support for community development. Most times, very primary support that will not do any transformation of those communities into self-independent, self-sufficient communities. Um, we also have a question of uh, many of our countries that rely on fossil fuel. That's how they create the domestic revenue to finance their own social goods, to finance governance. And there's a lot of pressure now coming uh, from partners that says, we're going to cut off assistance unless you stop producing fossil fuels. Uh, the reliance then is on, well, we're going to get through, through uh, the COP arrangements. There's going to be a flow. And we know that there have been so many meetings with the COPs and the uh, commitment to provide this level of financing to enable countries just has not come. The money has not come. And when it comes to forests, there's not a big, it's like the gold rush now, carbon credits. Uh, all the capitalists, are, we're going to do carbon credits. And that's where we're going to enable you to get, well, carbon credits is not well known by the communities where the forests are hardly known to by the governments. This is something new. And so that's going to be another area that's going to lead uh, uh, to corruption, to deals, and to all those types of things. So maybe now we may have to, some of our countries in the Global South, decide that if the money isn't coming, we're going to be very clear about barter arrangements. We'll go back to the old days. You know, if you want me to stop uh, doing fossil fuels, then give me a hydroelectric plant, mm -hmm. or give me a solar plant. Give me something that I know is substantive, is going to lead to financing things that will improve the lives of people. So climate change, climate change is real, and the effects of it on, our, on many of our countries are very devastating. 
unless we find a means to respond to those by providing a means whereby they can have this transformation to the means of getting the energy that they leave for the development, uh, then we'll be talking about this and not really being able to, to get the effects of making a, a world that's greener, a world that's better. So I, I know that we are over time, but um, you know, if anybody wants to have a very quick one sentence reaction um, to that, but um, and then we can move from there. Yes, and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. All right, thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you. To our audience. Um, this has been a wonderful event. I want to thank you, Madam President, for joining us. Thank our panelists. And um, stay tuned. Conversation's still going on, and you're invited. Thank you.